Guck mal, wir sind rum. Guck mal. Guck mal hier oben. Da sitzt zu viel im Licht. Ich glaube, wir müssen dann etwas zurück, weil irgendeiner von uns ist dann nicht im Fokus. Oh. Ups, here we go. I have a little problem here. Ah, uh, no. Oops. Okay. So, now I am in presentation mode. Hi, Petra. Um, I'm talking to the participants, uh, to the, all those that are looking at this presentation. Are you uh, hearing me well? Are you there? Good morning, yes, we can hear you well. Thanks, Martha. And everyone is the same. <clears throat> can we proceed? Yes, Professor. Yes, everyone. everything is, is clear, thank you. So let's start with this uh, presentation of the tutorial. Our symposium is the novel techniques for electron microscopy and nanomaterials and their heterostructures. The instructors will be uh, Christian Kiselowski, you have seen him, and Quentin Ramas from uh, the Super STEM, and Christian from the National Center for Electron Microscopy and the Molecular Foundry at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And myself, I work at the Instituto Politecnico Nacional in the School of Physics. And uh, I will be giving the instruction, the introduction, excuse me. Any questions at any moment, please go ahead. Here is Christian and Quentin, of course. And we are focusing on advanced techniques for nanoscale characterization by using electrons. Of course, the topics will include recent advances in instrumentation and application of novel techniques together with simulation leading to a better understanding of nanomaterial properties. In this case, we have a high spatial resolution for the images and also a high energy resolution of spectroscopy as uh, special interests. We are planning, as you have heard, three sessions, this introductory session, uh, then methods based on TEM or phase contrast and methods based on SDM images. The whole range of electron microscopy will be um, sketched, including the variation of electron energy and voltage together with a reduction of the interaction between the electron beam and the sample. That means reducing the dose rate, how many electrons hit the sample, controlling that particular parameter. Of course, we don't require any prior knowledge of electron microscopy, but a good understanding of the need of high resolution without damaging or changing the structure of the sample by using the beam without any care. And then we'll be having a special interest in achieving the highest possible resolution with a very limited electron dose rate to avoid damage or damage to sensitive samples. That will be the main objective of this tutorial course. We are planning four or five hours at most. And um, as I said, we will touch the principles of phase contrast. Uh, and the different principle and also the principles of STM image formation with some interpretations. That is uh, a review of uh, what we will be working on uh, in this uh, review. 
I'm trying to find my second presentation just a little bit. I will start with a conceptual view to start with the beginning of electron microscope, electron microscope. Then we will go a step further to see some of the details and then we will finish with some images. So um, how do we start with microscopy? First, micros is a small, scopios look at, look at small things. And uh, you can see here a rather conceptual view of how microscopy starts helping the human eye limitations by allowing some magnification of objects that we don't see. And the development, of course, of an optical microscope and the development then of an electron microscope. It's historic figures in microscopy go back to uh, Van Lovenbeck, Lovenhal, and uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, then goes to Robert Hooke with the understanding of electrons. Ernest Ave gives a very interesting concept related to uh, how the electrons can be manipulated. And finally, Ernst Ruska uh, conceptualizes everything and creates an electron microscope. Even in a lecture given by Richard Feynman speaks about how to improve electron microscopy. These are the figures that create electron microscopy as we conceptualize it today. Of course, we can divide it by the resolution talking about optical microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. And of course, the transmission or scanning transmission electron microscope. Microscope. The light microscope, of course, has different lenses. The objective lens goes very close to the object of the sample or the specimen with a light source, and the oculars give us a magnified view of the images obtained. The SCM or scanning probe microscope samples the sample or scans the sample and uh, gives rise to a signal that can be uh, captured with a detector and then this detector gives us an image. So the sample is hit by the specimen, produces signals, go to a detector, this detector translates the signals into a sample, into an image, and this is done point by point scanning the sample. And of course, we have the transmission electron microscope with a bunch of lenses where the electron source produces the electron beam, a bunch of electrons that are condensed and sent to the sample. In the sample, normally they are transmitted. And with the help of the objective lens, the intermediate lenses, and the projector lenses, we get a magnified image with many details. So this is how the basic microscope classifications are given. In the light microscopy or optical microscopy, we have a light source. In the electron microscopy, electrons are used to see light, to see. Light is replaced by an electron gun built into the column, as I just showed before. In the light microscope, we have glass lenses. In the electron microscope, we need something that can handle the electrons and electromagnetic lenses need to be used. The magnification is changed by changing lenses in the optical microscope. In the electron microscope, focal length is changed by charging the current and scope. That is the principle of these electromagnetic lenses. And when we change the focal length, we improve 
or we get with a change in the magnification. To view the results, we see an ocular lens in the light of microscope, which is probably familiar to most of you. In the electron microscope, there is a fluorescent screen or a digital camera attached, and then we can see the images in a monitor. Of course, in the light microscope, we need no vacuum, but in the electron microscope, the elect entire electron path from the gun to the camera must be on the vacuum to avoid any interactions between the electrons and anything that can be in the air. Now, what is so good about electrons? And to respond to that question, we need to know to talk about resolution and resolving power. We need to talk about how the electrons are ejected from the electron gun, how they are treated by the electromagnetic lenses, and why we need a vacuum technology. Of course, resolution is measured by the capability of distinguishing between two separate adjacent objects of sources of light. In other words, the minimum distance that we can distinguish in a, in a, in a sun or in an image. And the resolving power then is the ability to make points or lines we are closely adjacent in an object distinguishable in an image. So the resolution, the minimum distance, the resolving power is the ability to do that. Of course, our eyes are limited. We can see a beautiful butterfly and the distances between the dots of the body of this body might not be so apparent until we use a microscope. So this is a nice resolution for a fly or a bee. And we can see little things. The ability to distinguish between two objects is precisely the resolution. And the resolving power relates to how much we can go that to use that ability. Here, for example, the eyes can be nicely resolved into little dots that this bee has. That is a poor resolution. The wavelength is, as you see, with a low frequency. A good resolution, the ability to distinguish more things which are closer together and that are in the sample. And we have a good resolution here. A poorer resolution and not so good resolution. How do we do that? Increasing the frequency. Now, let's remember how an atom is made of electrons, neutrons, protons, as we are showing here, right? So we need to produce electrons for an electron microscope. It can be done by, this can be done by mainly three different sources tungsten and lab six or lanthanum hexaboride that normally give rise to a thermo emission electron beams. That means that we have to heat the filament to have a work distance uh, that can be overcome by the electrons. In the atom, at electrons stay in the atom because in order to emit them, we need to provide energy, the working distance energy to eject, to produce a beam of electrons. These two need to be hit, need to be, need to go to higher temperature so that we can reduce or have sufficient to have emission. In this other one, the field emission gone, additionally to heating or heating might not be necessary, we can <clears throat> uh, introduce an electrostatic field and have the possibility 
of emitting electrons in that way. Of course, the prices and the benefits are different for each of these three main sources of electrons. Now, after that, in the electron microscope comes a column with electromagnetic lenses. These are to manipulate the electron beam so that we get the function that we need. There is an electrical coil that will produce an electromagnetic field when current goes through this coil with soft iron pole pieces to produce this electromagnetic effect. And this is the column where the electromagnetic lenses are. Everything has to be in vacuum and with a very, very small gas pressure. And in that case, electrons behave pretty much as light. So these are the principles conceptually from a conceptual point of view of the electron microscopes. There are different electron microscopes, as I mentioned, or different modes. Some of them are transmission electron microscopes, others are scanning. Yeah. We can use also focus ion beam microscopes. Yeah. And this is the column in a transmission electron microscope, which is mostly the subject of this tutorial. The electron source with the electrons are produced, and then a bunch of uh, lenses. First, the condenser system that the function is to bring the electrons from the source in a correct way so that the image can be created by the objective lens, which is normally here, and magnified by the projector lenses. Some of these projector lenses are called intermediate lenses because they have a specific function, but, and what they have the specific function is to get diffraction, of course, which is one of the main advantages of electron microscopy. That's the electron beam moving across the lens system. If you calculate what the, resolution is for uh, electrons with a such a small wavelength, you will be see, as we will see in a minute, when we go to the details, that uh, we stay behind expectations. That means we, are, we should be able to see moving electrons with a high resolution, and we don't see that. And that is due to defects in the lenses. Then aberration correction needs to be done. Recently, 10, 15 years ago, aberration correction was firstly com first commercialized. And nowadays, uh, there are many microscopes with these characteristics with, where specific aberrations can be corrected. Like for example, the spherical aberration or chromatic aberration. What does that mean? Spherical aberration has to do with the fact that the electron beam crosses away from the axis, it will be focused in a point. And if it goes closer, it will be focused in another point. That reduces the resolution because not all beams are focused at a single point. That means that we have to select a disk of minimum confusion. What does chromatic aberration mean? It means that if the electron beam has slightly different wavelengths, they will be focused at a different spot. Here, the colors are used only to illustrate that fact. With chromatic aberration, if there is a difference in wavelength, a small one, it will be focused in one point, and another with a deep difference will be focused in another point, given also rise to a risk of confusion. So if we have that, we have multiple focal points and an image which, if not blurred, with a lower resolution. So TEM enables tomography. There are techniques to do that. And uh, 
They will not be covered here in this tutorial, but that exists. This can be, you need to do for this a different procedure, change different parameters of the sample and look at the sample in different projections to observe 3D emission, but this is possible. We can also do environmental microscopy, have a specific environment around the sample and see what happens in situ, in action. That is the end. What is a scanning transmission of electron microscopy? Here is an image of that. And uh, of course, the scanning transmission goes after the principle of scanning the sample. And in this case, detecting the produced signal when the beam sits in a specific place with a detector after the sample, after the beam is transmitted. Different things can be done with the scanning transmission electron microscopy, as you will see later on. And here are some examples. Here, the electron source produces a beam. The condenser beam is, the condenser lenses, excuse me, makes the beam go directly. And to the sample, in this example of a simple scanning electron microscope, a signal is produced due to this impact between the beam and the sample. Everything is in vacuum. And we need detectors to read what signal was obtained. So in TEM is a broad static beam. In SEM, SEM the beam is focused to a fine point. And the sample is scanned line by line, point by point in a line, and then it jumps to the next line and continues. We need a relatively high TM voltage from 60 to 300 kV. In SEM, the needs are much lower, not necessary to penetrate the sample. In SCNT, the sample must be rather thin so that the electron beam can go through. In SCM, there is a wide range of specimens allowed. We only look at the surface. For imaging, for images, the electrons must pass through and be transmitted by the specimen, with or the detectors, or the screen, or the following lenses pick up the signal, the electron signal, after it has gone through the sample. In SEM, the signal is collected near the surface of the specimen. Then PEM, transmitted electrons are collectively focused by the objective lens, and then transmitted or incorporated to the effect of the magnifying lenses to create a real image. In SEM, the beam is scanned along the surface of the sample to build up the image. Point by point, line by line, signal is produced, a detector picks up that signal and produces a, an image point by point, line by line. So conceptually, that is the case. Other equipment that is also popular nowadays is the focular focus in iron beam. You see here some examples, how you can cut, how you can weld, how you can do different things with the FIP. So normally you have a dual beam system with an SEM incorporated to the FIB, and you can see what you're doing from this point of view. I will not be touching too much. This is part of a presentation, and that's why I'm showing it, because it sometimes also comes together, and it might be available to some of you 
the use of an FIB with an SCN. You can see something similar to something that is popular nowadays, but it is not. It's only pollen of a plant structure. So, electron and ion microscopes are used for many applications, industrial application, life sciences, scientific research, natural resources and energy. So for all these type of industries, electron microscopy is useful. I remember in my PhD times working for turbines and how the nickel alloys will handle the extreme temperatures that they need to uh, during the application what they need to hear more applications or electronics health or different things right so life science applications there are plenty you have to be especially careful here to um, control the beam sample interaction which in this particular presentation is not Allow. This is, as I said, an introductory talk with many concepts, starting from the beginning, from light sources, from optical microscopes, going through SEM, and going to TEM. Of course, TEM allows a high resolution. SEM, not so high. An optical microscopy is the poorest of all of three. But this doesn't mean that one is not useful and only TEM is important. Normally, if you want to find out how the leaves of a tree are, you need to know how the tree is, how the branches are, and how the leaves in the structural conformation are. So the three techniques are very important, are complementary. And if electron microscopy lacks something that is precisely, loc that is a localized technique, we need also non-localized techniques too characterize materials or anything that we are interested. The areas that we look in TM are smaller and smaller, so we need to complement them with other possible uh, <coughs> techniques. So any questions up to here? No. I'm sharing now to a more detailed presentation, but going over what we've seen in a conceptual way. Any question, colleagues? Should I speak Spanish for you all? All good for me, thank you, Hector. Hector, I see you have a question from Ivan Garcia. Go ahead. Uh, hi, how are you? Thank you for the presentation. Uh, according to the source of electrons that you have mentioned, what would be the most convenient if we want a higher resolution or we want to obtain a better micrograph? What would be the best, uh, the, the best source of, of electrons? Or what I would hope be the reply to that later on? But um, oh, well. it depends on your sample. It depends uh, the availability that you have. And as I said, Characterization inc should, must include a non-localized technique, whatever it is, X-ray diffraction, uh, for example, optical microscopy, something that gives you the broad idea and then go to the leaves of the tree with TEM or STEM. Both are very good. You have to be careful not to change the structure or the nature of the sample but both are very good. The resolution is very good. But another thing that you have to learn, interpretation. You will be seeing a projection of the sample 
and we are used to see a 3D with the projection including included in our eyes. So you have to change how you interpret images and get as much of each technique. In my opinion, TEM and STEM or SEM are very good and you have to use them all the time, but by no means alone. And according to what you mentioned, or uh, field emission gone and uh, lanthanide gone, I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were three uh, three sorts of electrons, or two, uh, three ways of producing those electrons. Uh, there would be any difference between them, or it would be the same for all of them? No, it will be a, definitely a, a, a difference. In a specialized course of TEM, I normally teach that the problem with the field emission gone and thermoionic sources like tungsten and hexaborur, lantan hexaborur, is precisely the size of the source and the difference that that introduces to aberrations. Remember what aberrations are? The defects in the lenses. Yeah? Basically, spherical and chromatic aberration. So if they don't come, if the electrons don't come from a point source, these aberrations will tend to be larger, right? So the most you approach to a point source, the most you get to a higher resolution image. So which one is the one that gives you a better uh, source, a smaller source? of course, the field emission goal, right? And that's why it becomes much and much useful, right? Okay, thank you very much. So let's go here now more on more details for uh, principles, samples, and finally, let me show you some images. So TEM is a unique technique. It has an ability to, 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 keep, to provide morphological details like crystal sizes, grain boundaries in material, interfaces, phase distribution, defects, and so on, as well as the crystallography, the atomic structure, the chemical composition, details on the bonding and coordination number in the sample. TEM is one of the most versatile and efficient techniques of characterization of materials. It is localized. You have to combine it with a non-localized technique so that you have the full vision of your sample. But it's very good. So how does it work? How goes from the cones to the lenses to the specimen stage? What is the resolution? What can we do? Basically, Sometimes we forget that the TEM can do diffraction. And that is the main, main quality, the main property that we can take advantage of in a TEM. We can get, we can get, obtain images by using diffraction, by using interaction between the beams. We can select the area from where the diffraction is obtained and that's called selected area. We can use a parallel beam and get low doses, or we can use also a converging beam and get converging beam electron diffraction. Additionally, we can do chemical analysis by electron dispersion, energy dispersion spectroscopy or energy loss spectroscopy, and also by filtering energy. Here are the basic characteristics of a TEM. The electron gone at the top of the column. Here is the column where the condenser lenses, the objective lenses, and the magnifying lenses are. Here is the specimen holder. The objective lens normally is here. The most important lens in the microscope. It gives rise to the image, produces the first image, and is therefore the most important lens in the microscope. Here is the specimen holder where the sample goes, here right in between the objective lens. And here is where the 
images form. Normally now we have viewing image viewing uh, monitors or screens here to see the image. But the chamber is where the image is formed and uh, normally we have here a camera or a detector to form to give rise to the images up here. So this is a basic TEM. And another point that we should not forget, we are not looking at the sample in the normal way with our normal eyes and with our normal image. A good analogy is here presented. We are looking at a projection, right? Something that is projected. The sample is here and it is projected onto the screen or the image. Okay, this is the electron source. This is the analogy with a lamp, of course, but very similar. The objective lens forms the image and it is magnified by the magnifying lenses to give rise to a projected image. Everything in one single plane. A 3D of the sample reduced to a 2D in the image. So here is a, a better comparison with the light microscope and the electron microscope. We look at the reflected light here or the transmitted light here directly with the ocular. Here we see a projection and we are looking it from the sun. Then the vacuum must be around 10 to the minus seven or better. Depends on the type of cone, of course. We don't want a very fine uh, filament to the very fine filament with a very high radius of curvature to become you know, flat, then the vacuum has to be good to avoid any damage to the electron gun. Okay. These are how the filaments look like, small crystals, pointed crystals, as you can see here. They come in this little thing. That's a gun or part of the gun. This is just a filament, the full gun has uh, other components to be able to change the current that circuit that goes through the whole system and a couple of electrostat a, a single electrostatic lens to condense the beam. That is called the wellness cylinder that is not shown here, but it's part of the electron beam source. This, this is the source, the electron beam gun. So here is the current density, how many electrons are produced with a tungsten filament. The probe size is about five nanometers. That is what we measure at the sample. With a lab six, the probe size becomes 1.5 nanometers and the current density becomes a bit higher. And with the FEG, the field emission goes higher to this. This is a number, numbers are, are, are in, in, at present might be a bit different than higher for this FEG sources. And the probe size is less than one nanometer in size. So these are the improvements you asked me before What's the best? Of course, the field emission gun is the best, but it's the most expensive. Then, the lenses in the TDM, the condenser lenses control how the strong wind, how strongly the beam is focused or condensed onto the sun. At low max, can spread the beam to illuminate a large area. At high max, the beam is condensed very strongly it goes to a smaller area. The objective lens, I said, is the most important because it forms the image. It has to have the best possible quality so that we avoid resolutions and we have the highest possible resolution. 
you will see that in STM, we have to work here in the convention less to correct aberrations. You will see that in TEM, you have to work here to improve resolution if you want to correct aberrations. And then there's a bunch of lenses to magnify the TEM image. Here is a more schematic, the electron gun, the condenser lens, the objective lens, the sample comes in between, and the intermediate and projected lenses. All of these are projection lenses to magnify the sample, but the intermediate lens is there because it is used also to get the diffraction part. So that's why it's so important, this intermediate lens, and it's called like that. So here is a, a, a schematic diagram how the beam is controlled by one or two condenser lenses, how the image is formed here, and how the different images are formed here. As you can see here at the intermediate or the back focal plane of the objective lens, the beams are crossing, focusing, and here is where the diffraction pattern forms. Of course, the back focal plane of this objective lens becomes the object plane of the intermediate lenses. And we can work here to get a good view of the diffraction pattern. Here, there is a small procedure to get a correct diffraction pattern. We have to focus the image and do a small procedure that goes more into the operation of the TEM, but it is a rather important point that we can get diffraction and where it forms in the objective back focal plane. Resolution, we spoke about resolution. How do we measure it? Normally we use the Riley criteria, which is this wavelength and the aperture or the angle at which the electrons are coming. Of course, we can calculate the wavelength in different ways, but the best way is to use some, um, I forgot the considerations, but relativistic con 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 considerations. And uh, for example, for green light, the wavelength is 400 nanometers, the resolution is about 150 nanometers. For electrons with an energy of 200 kV, the wavelength is around 0.025, and the resolution will be 0.2 angstroms. This is one tenth of the size of an atom. We should be able to see easily atoms with electrons, but it is not true. Why? because there are aberrations, as I said before, and here are more clearly described than in the conceptual part that I showed before. The chromatic aberration, where different wavelengths give rise to different focusing. The blue focus is different to the red focus. So a point in the object forms a disk in the image, the resolution is lost. Here is the concept for a spherical aberration where depending where the electrons cross the lens, they are focused in different points. Of course, we select to focus at the disk of minimum confusion, but again, a point gives rise to a disk in the image, a point in the object give rise to an image of the image. Here is how we measure the spherical aberration, how we concept that, and there is a constant here, a CS, the coefficient of aberration, that is typical for each microscope. That gives a parameter to judge how good the microscope is. The smaller CS is, the better the microscope becomes. So there has been sample interaction. <clears throat> the incident beam goes through 
if we use this image with the transmitted electrons, we will see bright field, dark field, high resolution in TEM, right? If we see elastically scattered electrons, we can see diffraction, we can see dark fields, we can see many things, right? If we have an SEM and we uh, have a detector for backscattered electrons, then electrons that are from the incident beam, but go through interactions and they are going in the different, in, in that, in, the, in, in a back direction. Then we have images, interesting images in SEM. Or if we use secondary electrons, electrons that are produced due to the interaction of the beam and the sample, normally in the SEM we have images for secondary electrons. So this is the beam sample interaction that is used to produce images. As I said, in STM happens also something similar, the scanning beam moving across the sample, depending where you put your detector across the sample, you will have a bunch of different signals and different images, like the bright field with the transmitted beam, the dark field, which is the opposite to the bright field, and if you have a detector in an annular manner, you have the annular detector images. In a stem, the electron beam is rastered or scanned across the surface, very similarly to a scanning electron microscope that we saw before. But the sample is very thin and it goes through. So the collector, the detector are on this side of the sample, not above, like in an SEM. So basically, this is how it works. Specimen preparation, we need to have something that doesn't damage the nature of the sample. Normally, we have uh, grids of uh, three millimeters, we can deposit powders or small wires or small things, or else we in FIB, we can cut out a sample. We have to be careful with this sample preparation, but there are experts that can prepare few beautiful samples without damaging the sample with the focus ion beam and getting incredible results. I invite you to see uh, uh, Petra Speck's talk in our symposium. I'm sure she will show some of her beautiful results uh, using FIB to extract the sample. Specimen preparation normally can, do, can be done with an iron milling to uh, cut an, uh, a small disc to three millimeters and then prepare it, dimple the center and iron mill until a hole appears. And around the hole, if you were careful and you did not damage the sample, you can see many interesting things. Another way, is to use a jet polisher, cut small discs carefully also, and then prepare it by electro polishing to get a nice hole around. My fr biological friends know that ultra microtomy can also ultra microtomy can also be used, avoiding iron milling damage and preparing good uh, either ceramics or biological samples. The specimen holder where you put the sample right there, there are many types. Some of them can be double tilting in what direction, left, right, or up and down. You can put one sample, you can put two samples, you can hit and deform some samples. There are very specific sample holders for this operation. Here is a magnified view of one of them and how it is tilted in the electron microscope. Of course, all this is connected to uh, uh, controls that the operator can manipulate. As for images, you can take in the TM two types of images, diffraction contrast 
and then you can call it dark field and bright field. And also you can use an interference and use all the beams, all the diffractive beams and make use of interference to get face images. Here, for example, we have bright field image. We have selected with the objective aperture one beam, the transmitted beam, and we get the bright field image. Everything that produces diffraction appears dark or gray. Everything that went through without any interaction appears bright. In the dark field, it's the other way around. We have to select one beam, put the objective aperture to select that beam, and everything that looks bright is that produced that beam. Everything that looks dark did not contribute to that beam. Here, for example, with diffraction, strong diffraction, and intermediate stages. So this is a transmitted signal, a diffraction contrast, but we also can have thickness and mass contrast. As the sample becomes thicker, the contrast change, and you can see thickness ranges. And if you have low mass, you have low mass like carbon, like lithium, or you have dark mass like uranium, like something heavier, of course, you will have a different contrast. Examples of different dark fields for a single sample and the bright field. You can see here areas that look dark, strongly diffracted. If you select the right diffracted beam, then you see them clearly in the dark field, the corresponding dark field. This dark field doesn't show all the details of the bright field. For that, you have to select different reflections in the diffraction pattern, and then you get the corresponding nice image. Phase contrast. You let all the beams through the objective aperture. You let them interact and give rise to interference. And this is what you get. Here, for example, we have a high resolution image of bottom nitride film on silicon, the silicon substrate and the bottom nitride. You let all of the sun, all of the diffracted beams interact and you get a phase contrast image where interference in between the atom, between the beams is produced. One of the most important parts of electron of, of the TEM and the same is the electron diffraction. We get diffraction in, from the sample. We get the possibility to characterize it completely according to the crystallinity that, or the crystal that we can observe. There is a whole bunch of things, but Bragg's law also applies here, as you can see. You can see this part from Bragg's law assuming some values, not assuming, but some realistic values for that. And you can see that the microscope needs to be characterized with something known so that we know the camera length. And with that camera length, then we can find the distances between the different reflections, which is equivalent to say the difference of the interplanar distance for any crystalline materials. This is the information that we can get from measuring R, from knowing L, the camera length, and also by relating to the energy and the wavelength of the electrons or the energy that we are using. So conceptualization can be done by implying the reciprocal lattice, another way to view a crystal lattice that we can use to understand the fraction patterns. So one can go on and on explaining this reciprocal lattice is how we can interpret them in real space and in reciprocal space. For example, of course, in reciprocal space, everything is one over D. In real space is D. And with that, we can characterize by diffraction 
the sum. Of course, this can be extended to a 3D reciprocal lattice, which has the same definitions, right? And use lattice vectors for the reciprocal lattice that are corresponding to lattice vectors in real space. Mm -hmm. And obtain different values. Why do we see so many spots in the diffraction pattern? Normally, when we do X-rays, we see a peak and then another peak and then another peak, and we have to be moving the detector to collect intensities at different diffraction angles. And for that, for explanation, we have this equal sphere, an equal and a sphere that has a radius one over the wavelength. Remember that the wavelength of the electrons was very large. Then this that we have here actually is very flat and touches many, many spots of the reciprocal lines. And I call it myself the, remember that, God, that king that everything that he touched became God, Midas or Midas, I don't know in English how it's pronounced. I call the eagle sphere the golden king because it is so flat that it touches. Everything that touches this eagle sphere becomes a diffraction spot. <clears throat> that is the analogy. So it is so flat that it touches many. And this is one of the main advantages of the TEA. You have so many diffraction spots. You have so much information on the crystals and on the sample. But remember, small portion of the sample. You need to go and do more characterization techniques that are not so localized. We can go on and on with this. Of course, this is just an introduction. And uh, I will be ending my presentation with uh, this view of the possibilities in a TEA. One thing will follow, and Christian, I think Christian is the next one, telling you more about TEM and STEM. I hope this introduction is or has been useful to some of you. Um, my time is almost up, so, but I always have, we always have lots of interest in your questions. Please, if there's any question at all in this introductory part, let me know. Yes, doctor, I have one question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. What is the best way to prepare the simple iron milling uh, way or focused iron beam? Uh, 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 manner technique is better and uh, how much area we need to prepare uh, we need to prepare complete sample or we can we need to prepare uh, only few part of the sample it actually depends very much on your sample if you have a bunch of uh, thin films for example i would prepare a couple in different areas why mm -hmm. because it's a localized technique right you need to have some statistics and I would prepare a couple to see where they are. And if they are different, I'm in trouble, then I prepare another two because I don't have the whole picture, right? Yes. In other words, you need to use another technique, a non-localized technique like X-rays or like uh, any other that samples a larger portion of your, of your uh, material. But if that is not possible, then you have to go and prepare a couple of samples and see if they are more or less the same. And if there is any difference, then you have to prepare another two. That is the point of a localized technique. And still, if you cannot use a non-localized technique, you are in trouble because four little leaves of a big tree might not be representative of the tree. Although many times, since we prepare it with the same technique, a couple of samples is enough. I forgot the other part of your question. Can you repeat? First, I ask, uh, what is the best way to prepare the simple iron milling or focused iron milling? And uh, second one is uh, about area. 
like how much area we need to prepare like if we have bigger sample then mm -hmm. we prepare in the small part of the sample or we need to still we need to prepare in the complete part of the sample yeah i know, i see now why i was confused i mean preparing a couple of samples always give you an idea if your sample preparation is giving you trouble okay because you see differences and they might be due to the sample or to the sample prep so you need to see your sample and judge is my sample prep good enough am i reducing it with a for example in focus ion beam you can only cut one part and then you have to uh, thin it is my thinning technique good enough or am i doing too fast right yes can i introduce another technique to thin it instead of what i'm using or should i reduce the energy that i'm using things like that and this is a difficult part of the of the of the sample prep see but you really have to know or you really have to be have in mind that what you're looking at might be affected by the sample prep and you have to test that what you are seeing is similar what would you see what would you do this is my question if you have for example thin films and in one film you don't see these locations and in the other one you, it is full of these locations what would you think mm, yeah it's hard uh, means i don't know very well one possibility is that you prepare the sample differently and that somehow you bend the sample or the, or the sample prep procedure has produced some dislocations. So I would prepare a couple more and see if the dislocations are, I mean, with different energies and with different procedures and being careful. But sample prep is really, really, really one of the most important parts of electron microscopy. Okay, doctor. Thank you. It's Thank very you. difficult and it's very complicated, but it, I can assure you that it's 60% of the success of your electron microscopy observation. Okay, doctor, thank you so much. Thank you for participating. Este, es, disculpe, doctor. Any other questions? Este, doctor Hector? Sí. Este, disculpe. Eh, ¿Podríamos hacer a las 11 a.m. un receso eh, aquí en el, eh, en el Congreso? Haremos un un momento de coffee break de once a once y media. Okay. Sí. Very good. Okay. Thanks. I will tell everyone. Okay. Uh, Christian and everyone else who couldn't speak Spanish, uh, I was just told that uh, at 11 there will be a coffee break in Cancun. So we have to make a, a brief pause, I suppose, like 30 minutes. That's so, just so. fine with me. How, how much how much time and when do we should, shall we meet again we stop at 11 and i propose to come back at 11 30. in half an hour or i i i i don't know if half an hour is too long i'm putting it for uh, uh what's the time now i have five o'clock that is uh 11 right? it's 10 or 7 now it's uh 15 minutes enough guys Are all of Just you tell us what we must do, Hector. Yeah. <laughs> so is, is the break now? In the break in, in one hour. If the break is in one hour, then I guess Christian could get started and then make a, a small pause in the, in the middle and then finish yeah. off afterwards. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Very it's, good. It's ten. It's it's ten o'clock in Cancun now, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, it is ten ten. Yes, now. So at eleven, we make a brief stop and we go back. 15, 20 minutes. No problem. Later. No problem. I can interrupt any time, you know. Uh, Ivan has just raised his hand. Uh, Ivan, do you have a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I have some doubts uh, all, uh, as well of, about the preparation of the of the sample. Uh, do you do you have any other uh, any other way to prepare uh, that is not so sophisticated that we can prepare the, the sample different from ion milling and focus ion beam. So if we don't have those equipments, 
can we have some other option to, to prepare the samples and obtaining good results as well? Uh, those are the established techniques, but uh, what kind of sample do you have? For example, if I have a, a thin film that is very hard, uh, well, well, for example, in my case, I uh, specifically, I work with silicon oxycarbide. So in general, it's very hard, that material. And if I don't have an equipment like that, for example, so sophisticated, can I have some other options, such uh, another equipment or some other technique? No, no, I, I, I don't know of any. Maybe Christian or Quentin can give you more advice, but in my case, I, I, I don't have any. I, I can offer you to use my equipment if you like, but that's as much as I can. We oh, have uh, Pitch right here. You. She does good samples. So. <laughs> Maybe you could do some some standard mechanical milling. Um, I know a colleague who did had very good results with silicon oxide samples and uh, with dimpling, but it, it takes a long time to get really experienced. That's a thing. So you have to get through some uh, first frustration period, I'm afraid, in, in order to make them thin enough so that you know that um, the, the samples are not uh, too thick when you put them in the final iron mill. So we have to give enough time to, to prepare the samples as well to obtain good results. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it just takes, uh, takes a lot of experience. And for the hard samples, um, it is difficult because they, they tend to break if you make them too thin in the mechanical uh, procedures. So you really have to practice quite a bit in order to make them not too thin so that they don't break, and but thin enough so that you don't, that it doesn't take forever if afterwards you mill them. Because the final step is usually an iron mill then still. It's difficult, Ivan, but the advantage but, but it's doable the, the normal mechanical procedure is doable you just have to, to have patience and uh, and practice it and the rewards are great you will have a characterization that is absolutely unique so but it takes time as petra you said it takes some time to prepare good samples okay because what well, polishing can take hours like five you know <laughs> Yeah, my God. So, well, I was telling that because I was, well, I have listened that there are some cases in which they use only like a knife or something uh, sharp. And with that, uh, they, they try to prepare the sample. So that wouldn't be very convenient then. Just like a mechanical preparation like that. Let me tell you the good news. In my whole life, which is pretty long in electron microscopy, you know, I have not seen a single sample that was not possible to make it thin. Anything can be made thin enough, period, you know. It's just, it might be very different, different you know, ways of doing this type of stuff. And what, what we see most of the time is one approach is you use, a, you know, the standard eye milling type of stuff if you have access to that. And the trick that we very often use is then we go with very low energy ions at the end to actually kind of peel up just the surfaces. And this last process is very, very important because you can imagine that if you shoot off atoms from the surface with the ion beam, you kind of create whole craters in the material, right? Wherever the ions hit, you know, they kind of take out a whole bunch of material. And you have to get out of that range so that you make what we call step flow, you know, so that we mill this uh, materials very slowly away so that you actually mill um, uh, atomic steps into the material. So if you go low enough with the voltage, you actually can make surfaces that is, are atomically stepped. And we do that almost always, you know. And so, yeah. So, so thank you. And then uh, there wouldn't be any, any other option. So it will be the, the only two that will give good results. Mechanical thinning, you know, there is then, then it depends on the pace that you use, you know. So if you use a very coarse grain, you make big grooves into the sample. 
And if you take a very small grain, you know, you need to <laughs> polish it very long, you know, but the grooves are getting smaller. But in the end, you will end up with grooves on the surface. And then in the end, you will have to kind of clean out these grooves. Very well understood. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Christian, the stage is yours. Okay, then uh, let me see whether I can kind of first do the share screen thing. And I do this. And I share that. Okay. And then I do this one. So do you see it? See it? Is it okay? Is everybody seeing it? Hello? Yeah. Can, yes, can see it. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. Please, please. <laughs> it, is, it is so odd to make a talk, you know, through this internet and you get no reaction from the audience. That is probably the most bothersome things that I know from, from this whole COVID business, you know. So, yes, I would like to talk about, you know, principles of phase contrast electron microscopy. And I will have a little bit a different level involved, you know. I'm really glad that Hector described the basics of electron microscopes before, because we will raise a little bit, you know, in the, in the refinement of this whole technique. And without the first talk, you would have probably difficulties to follow. Um, it might be such, you know, that it is anyway a little bit um, uh, hard to understand here and there. So that is my fault. So if you feel that that uh, uh, you must ask a question, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to kind of, you know, describe things in more detail if, if, if you have uh, problems to follow. So my name is Christian Kisilowski and I'm from the Molecular Foundry in Berkeley. And uh, I have a lot of friends all over the world, including, you know, Quentin and, and uh, Hector and other people who helped a lot over the last 10, 20 years. That's how long I am in electron microscopy, uh, together with many other colleagues, you know, to actually advance the field. And so uh, I'm very grateful to all these collaborations that we have with other people. And um, I will mention them, or the, the, the publications that I will list, will mention them in detail. So let me start out, you know, with the, let me see what I can do here. Oops. Okay. So this is, this is something, you know, which I kind of feel uh, is a good thing to do. Uh, I'm working for a user facility and the molecular foundry is actually a place where you can grow materials and characterize them and do theory on them. And you can work with nanoscale material, with biological material, with organic materials, and it's all put together into a big, big uh, facility. And the nice thing to come about, if you go there, the nice thing is that we have a beautiful bay view. And so you have actually, you know, this gorgeous rooms at the top of this building, which overlook the bay to San Francisco. It's a, a, a facility that is part sponsored by the Department of Energy. It uses, is, its usage is free of charge. So all you have to do is basically come over here. You have to pay for your salary. You have to pay for the flight and all this type of stuff on the accommodations. But anything you use in this facility is free of charge. Plus you have then um, uh, this uh, uh, ability to contact staff scientists like me in any of these facilities. And there's a lot of knowledge accumulated there that is very often beneficial. So the first thing I want to make is basically, you know, that the point that there is very different views about electron microscopy around, you know, some people think it's incredibly difficult. Some people think it is incredibly uh, easy. And, uh, and I wanted to kind of just show you one of the things where I really had to laugh, you know, at some point in time, several years ago, when I watched actually TV and there was this uh, NCIS, so that's Naval Crime, uh, uh, crime Scene Investigations. And there is this forensic specialist who is the electron microscopist there, you know, that's Abby. And she kind of, you know, has a case to crack, which is, you know, a bomb case. 
and um, uh, somebody kind of planted somewhere a bomb, made terror, and then they wanted to find or find this bad guy. And um, she kind of gets all the clues from her forensic electron microscopy work or microscopy work to find who the bad guys are. <clears throat> so there she is. And the picture that she showed is that picture. So at this point, I really got my camera out and copied the uh, photographed the TV because I had seen that picture before. It was kind of, you know, a picture that we just had published. It's a title page of nano letters where we had imaged for the first time a sheet of graphene. So Abby talked, you know, about a sheet of graphene that was the trigger of the bomb and she could see with her optical microscope, which is of course, nothing of it is true, but you know, the popular conclusion may be that electron microscopy is fast and easy because Abby can do it in half an hour, you know, and probably one can get images of graphene with uh, uh, optical microscopes. And so this is the popular conclusion that people show on TV. And I really, really want to make the point that nothing of this is true. Nothing, really nothing. If you want to kind of, you know, deal with electron microscopes, it's a very refined work. You have to have some understanding of the whole technique. It is not such that you just can get an image and know what is then suddenly in there. You know, and need to interpret the image. You have to have background knowledge. There is no way around it. You know, so that's why I kind of wanted to make that particular point. There is, of course, literature around, uh, you know, that is very well known in the field. So for those who uh, want to uh, have a little bit closer look in literature, you know, John Spence, who recently passed away, uh, wrote a beautiful book about high resolution electron microscopy. Um, Ludwig Reimer is a very, very good uh, source, you know, for of knowledge for electron microscopy. And of course, uh, uh, people in material sciences very often use uh, Williams and Carter transmission electron microscopy. These are the books, you know, that that you want to refer to if you kind of want to look into into electron microscopy in more detail. There are more specialized books in it. You know, there's uh, from Harald Rose, geometrical charge optics um, that shows you how aberration correctors are being built and how you do them and and and, and these types of aspects. And there's a nice book from Rolf Ernie about aberration corrected electron microscopy if you need to deal with that. Now, the other thing that we have is, of course, you know, um, uh, programs that do all these multi slice calculations that we actually need to apply to understand the images. And what for that purpose, we mostly use McTempest or Tempest, it was the company, totalresolution.com. That's where we do the simulations. Hector talked a little bit about that. So let me just, you know, refresh the whole uh, aspect, you know, electron microscopy is around since a long time, you know, the, the key discoveries is probably the electron and the Broglie, uh, the de Broglie wavelengths where people kind of um, uh, see that particles have a wavelengths attached, you know, uh, there is, there is uh, this discovery that, that uh, fields act as lenses. And then in 1931, you know, there was, uh, uh Gruskow built the first electron microscope. I mean, this is exactly 90 years ago, if, so if you don't think about that, right? So it's been a long, it's been around for a long, long time. There was, of course, first this TM that was really built by Ruska, but shortly afterwards, there was the uh, next uh, step when STM was built, you know, um, and then people started building the first electron microscopes. The first one was out from uh, Siemens, and you have a picture down there, and then there's, of course, you know, the American equivalent to two years later, which is this RCA electron microscope, and you see, I mean, people kind of made, started doing nice microscope uh, uh, advertisements for, for um, this type of technology. Now, and as years passed by, you know, microscopes came back, became better and better and better, you know. Uh, here's just another highlight from the 60s, beginning 70s, you know, that was basically cocaine who kind of introduced this weak beam technology technique where people um, uh, 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 started using electron microscopes to actually investigate dislocations in material, which are really an important part of the uh, uh, performance of matter. If there's dislocation, if there is a dislocation in the material, the material may behave very different from uh, uh, 
materials that do not have any dislocations in there. Also, you can see, you know, what we can do today with, with electron, uh, with, with mean, milling, sample milling, you know, look at the, uh, the scale down there on the left bottom, that's 0.5 micrometers. So the film is micrometers large, and I kind of have it thin over micrometers, and you do not see much of any, you know, uh, um, surface damage by, by uh, you know, the preparation to procedure. That is uh, what we usually do with electron microscopy. That's, that's the state of the art. So microscopy has steadily evolved. So after the 70s, where people looked a lot into materials, properties, dislocations, and atomic resolution microscopes came around. And I started electron microscopy, you know, actually doing this type of stuff. So we have this view graph on the left hand where you kind of see the resolution Hector talked about, you know, in, elect in microscopy and the year. And then you see, you know, there was first the light microscope and the resolution that you can get there is, uh, uh, several, you know, uh, uh, 10,000, uh, several thousand, you know, uh, angstroms. And then the, my electron microscope came around and it improved dramatically and very quickly. You know, this is anyway something which is um, quite remarkable with electron microscopy. Re electron microscopy evolves very fast. You know, you see that in the view graph directly, it shoots up there like crazy, you know. But then there was this one angstrom barrier. And this one angstrom barrier had the problem because that's where the aberrations hit us. And we needed to build aberration correctors and then we can improve the, the resolution to maybe half an angstrom, maybe a little bit better. So in the beginning, in the 80s, we did all this type of things with uh, atomic, this atomic resolution microscopy with high voltage microscopes, a million volt, you know, there you see that this uh, picture on the, on the left. It's a huge instrument, it's a tower, you know, over several, floors in, 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 a, in a building. And then, you know, in the uh, late 90s, we had the one angstrom microscope uh, where we kind of went down in voltage. Therefore, the things became smaller. Therefore, you can kind of fit them into a room and you couple computer technology to it. And suddenly these microscopes became better than actually the one million volt microscopes. For that reason, you will not find many in my one million volt microscopes on earth anymore. You know, they are just kind of too expensive and do not perform much better than actually, you know, the, the mid voltage microscopes. Then all the aberration correction came, kicked in, you know, and we have this team project and that was uh, finished in 2009. And it provided this new sort of microscopes, you know, that are boxed, that are encapsulated, you know, that have all this aberration correctors. So if if Hector talks about an aberration corrector, I put one image of this in here. You know, that's a CCCS corrector. Um, it, 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 is, uh, uh, it weights about, you know, um, 500 kilograms. So that is not a small piece of equipment. That's millions of dollars, right? And it has 155 power supplies. So if you do aberration correction in electron microscopy, it is quite expensive for that reason, you know? And, uh, um, and, if you, and you see, you have to evaluate very carefully, you know, whether or not you need to have this additional resolution that goes from, well below, uh, from one angstrom and below. That's where it really helps you. And it helps you really in spectroscopy as Quentin will point it out, you know? So I see Ivan raised the hand. So do you want to ask something? Ivan? No, no, thank you. I think I have left my raised hand. So. Ah, you left your hand. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is this is what what uh, what the technology looks at the moment. You know, um, the the latest microscopes that the Hector showed, you know, were a little bit advanced. Uh, so, for example, the 2000. This is a 2010 box. You know that we show there in the bottom, and Hector Schaut showed boxes from let's say two years ago or something like that. But nevertheless. Since we kind of went to half an angstrom resolution, and since it becomes very difficult to improve further on resolution because you hit further physical limits, one of the most important but pressing questions are what comes actually next? You know, if you want to have electron microscopy evolving, you know, in which direction would you like to go? And there's a big 
push in the society now to find out what is the best way to move forward and what what would you like to try out you know to uh, uh, see the next generation electron microscopes so this is for example you know one of the things that that came out over the last years uh, so what's next you know Imagine the following, you know, imagine you could build a microscope that does not even have only have one angstrom resolution, it also has one picosecond time resolution. So you kind of would combine a very ultra high resolution with an ultra high, uh, ultra fast uh, uh, performance. Now, the vial was one of the pioneers of that work. So they used this pump probe experiments uh, to actually um, use a laser beam to excite the sample and then kind of uh, produce a shot of electrons that moves towards the sample. And uh, you look what the sample uh, uh, does after the shock with some delay time. And you see, we talk now pul pulses, you know, that is something like uh, 200 femtoseconds to 10 picoseconds. Right, this is ultra fast microscopy that, that comes there, and you have delay times in the nanoseconds to microsecond range, and this is much faster than any detector can do, and uh, it kind of allows you to do things that were not possible to do before. It basically shows you structures in the that only exist in the time domain, and they do not exist statically. But this is, of course, a very very attractive field because you look into the possibilities to see materials, how they function, and not only what their static structure looks like. And you can, for example, uh, 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 Flanagan and Zivai recently published papers where they, where they see how, uh, you know, uh, phonons run through the crystals, you know, there is many other effects that they have observed, you know, all in the time domain, and all between, uh, you know, in the, in the range of nanoseconds, microseconds, down to picoseconds. And it would be lovely if we could kind of have a microscope, you know, that uh, works, let's say, from one picoseconds to a second at one angstrom, for example. Why not? Why don't we have that, you know? There's different ways of how to approach this thing. Um, um, this, this, this approach from Flanagan, for example, is one of them. There are others, and I will talk about that a little bit later. So, Hector talked about uh, this, this possibility of having a focused beam, a stem beam, you know, and then kind of uh, move the beam across the sample and scan the whole sample. And then there is this phase contrast microscopy uh, where you kind of have a parallel beam and make everything in one shot. And uh, there is this paper out there from Cowley in the late, late 60s, uh, which says basically, oh, there is this principle of reciprocity, which basically says, things are time invariant. You know, it doesn't matter whether you go in time forward or in time backward, you get the same thing. And you can look at these microscopes exactly in that manner. So if uh, you look at a stem, it would be something like an upside down TN, right? This is what I've drawn here, you know, in, in essence. So, so there is this uh, uh, reciprocity and you could kind of argue everything that I can do with a stem, you also can do with a TEM, right? So this is a wave optical argument, which is very valid, you know, but there is one, there is catches to it, you know, one is that it gaze goes with rays of beams, you know, so a, a ray of beam is, a, is a, a point, you know, it is an infinitesimal small point, and it cannot hold any electrons. So this argument does not consider how many electrons you deliver, which is really important, you know. And it is without any scattering in the sample, which is, of course, the thing that we would like to know, you know. So, yes, there is this principle of reciprocity, but technical implementations matter greatly. And in fact, you know, we have in the last years um, uh, uh, done a lot of work with microscopy companies to actually figure out what might be the best way to build the next, energy, uh, next generation electron microscopes. And maybe it is a hybrid of a STEM and a TM, you know. Hector showed this view graph also before, you know, so this is just, you know, one of the things that you find in many textbooks where, uh, you know, uh, it's just shown here in addition. There is just such a wealth of information in, in the, in the uh, uh, sample, in the sample area that comes with the scattering process. 
And uh, there are tons of different detectors that you can attach to, the, to a microscope to highlight basically or to drag, to pull out this particular information out of the uh, measurements that you would like to have. And so um, uh, uh, there are certain things you know, that, that you learn in textbooks. And uh, I wanted to point that out. If we talk about elastic scattering, we mean often you know, that the, the wavelength that comes in with the electron beam is the wavelength that goes out. And if inelastic scattering occurs, it's the wavelength is a little bit smaller um, uh, uh, than uh, the wavelengths going out. So um, basically the energy is related, the energy loss that comes with that uh, inelastic scattering process makes a small wavelength change in the electron beam, right? And so what I would like to do is um, uh, 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 focus on the coherent elastic scattered electrons of the phase contrast microscopy. Quentin will kind of take a lot of time to talk a lot about other things like incoherent elastic and inelastic scattering and um, uh, eels and, and EDS maybe um, that, that comes then after my talk. So some people, sometimes people ask me, you know, why, why is it such that you really want to do phase contrast microscopy? And you can do that and describe that to people in very simple terms. So you take, for example, at home, the picture of some, somebody who you love. In, in, this, in this case, you know, it is uh, uh, our small son, Mati, who was trying to kind of learn cello. And when he tried to learn that, you know, I, I, have, to, I have to say, you know, the first attempts were very, very similar to what, what you sometimes hear in, in zoos, you know, in terms of noises and things like that. So I try to mix Mati and the seal on the right-hand side. And you can do that easily. You can take an image and you can make a Fourier transform of an image. It gives you an amplitude and a phase. And that is uh, shown below. You know, the Fourier transform of what is amplitude and phase. And so in these two things, in the phase and the amplitude, there's the same information contained. It's just that our brain is not kind of built to process this information. Same kind of thing I can do actually with the seal. And you see the Fourier transform is very different. Um, you do not see so much in the phase but you see the amplitude is very, very different. And now you can make images that mix both of these things in a different manner. So for example, I can take the amplitude from Mati and I can use a face from the seal, Fourier transform it backward and see what is in the image. And you see it is the seal that is this, the blue one it's, that comes out there. So the amplitude has a lot of structural information seemingly, but the face carries the signal. It is dominated by the face. I can do this the other way around. You know, I can, can take the face from Mati and I, can, I take the amplitude from, from the scene and I get an image of Mati. It's always the face that actually has the strongest information available, even though our brain looks at the face and says, oh, there is nothing there, which is kind of, you know, a totally surprising aspect of this, of any image not only for electron microscopes. So what we do then basically is we take a plane wave and Hector described how this uh, microscopes look like. We shine a plane wave onto a, an, 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 uh, an object and it goes through the object. And once the plane wave leaves the object, we talk about the exit wave, you know, the, the, the electron wave that exits basically the surface. Uh, the sample there. And then there is a whole microscope with all its flaws, and it gives you a lot of aberrations that kind of can be, can be cured, can be corrected for. And what you then see in the image uh, uh, is, is an interferogram of beams. So this interferogram of beams, you know, is a structure. And of course, it is not easily interpretable. It can be very complicated, this, this uh, interferogram of beams, you know. But now the issue is basically is if we have an image like that, is there a way to actually go back and find from these images the structure? So we have to go up in this particular view graph. You know, we get a bunch of images in the bottom. We need to take care of the lens aberrations. We need to recover the exit wave function and then go back to the model and get out of these images the structure back. This is what we do. You know, this is uh, so we do not uh, use single images or very rarely use single images. 
we actually take the images and reconstruct an uh, um, image from them that directly shows you the projection of the structure. So uh, uh, um, um, that is something which kind of did not exist for a long, long time, but we do that now routinely. And it has huge advantages to do that. One of them being that you really can look at the image and understand oh, what's in there, right? Not just an interferogram of beams. So I will talk about these techniques. Just to show you how it looks like, is this is a nano rod, you know, so you see all the spots in the image. There's uh, on, the, on the bottom, for example, there's cadmium sulfide. Uh, copper sulfide is the, 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 the part of the image that looks in contrast a little bit weaker. So two different crystal structures. And it's a work that we did with Paul Alibizatos where we grow PN junctions into, into uh, uh, these type of crystals uh, so that we can use them for solar cells. Now, one, the point that I wanted to make here is A, this is a reconstructed wave function. And every dot in the image is where the atom columns are. You see, and the nature of this columns is also representative, represented. The heavier the atom, the stronger the contrast usually for particular thickness, but it is thickness dependent, which is kind of a thing that we have to take care of. Now, when people see such an image, you know, they usually talk about atomic resolution images and then they say, oh, I see the atoms. This is not true. Hector pointed rightfully out, you know, that usually you have a projection problem involved. And I show that in the left bottom there, you know, the beam comes from the top, it goes through the sample and makes a projection in the image. So what I see is columns of atoms and not atoms. And it took actually quite some time to actually kind of get in phase contrast similar atoms image, in particular, if they are light, like for example, carbon atoms. That was something which was for a long time impossible, but then became possible through the team project that we had here. And of course, you know, you can put these crystals together and then make this tetrapods out of that and get tomography on this tetrapods. And I, I'm pretty sure, you know, it doesn't work quite well in this presentation, you know, that, that uh, you show videos and, and things like that. So this is the next uh, uh, aspect that I wanted to, to highlight. Um, Electron microscopy, if you do it correctly, it's incredibly precise, you know, so so if there's something wrong in the in the in the images that you kind of see, you can be sure that there is something underlying either it is an artifact or it is true, and your your your, your task would be to figure out whether it is an artifact or whether it is true, but it is certainly significant. One of the things to show that is basically this atomic resolution in, uh, image, you know, that's from gallium nitride. Um, you see uh, this, this lattice is imaged here, and uh, we did a simulation from, from the structure. The simulation is the inset in the bottom. So you see all these multi-slice calculations that we do nowadays, they very well represent the structure of the material. What we fight about is, um, you know, to get the scale of gray values correct. You know, this is something which is kind of ongoing research. But let's take an image like this and just figure out, you know, how well you can measure atom positions. So we kind of uh, go through the image and there is uh, 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 two lattice parameters. One is in C direction, which is up, you know, and one is in A direction, which is sideways. And I just go atom column through atom column and I measure just kind of, you know, how well can I find, you know, the top of the intensity in these images. And you see on the right hand side, it is 1.3 picometers, right? The wavelength of electrons is 1.9 picometers in this type of so that is at the at the at the limit of what is possible. This is basically the wavelength of the electron beam. That is the precision that you can get by measuring, you know, for example, the, the distances of of, of uh, 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 planes in, in this type of images. It's actually quite remarkable. Of course, we went then back on you know and see what the ratios are with the um, to compare those x-rays and all. We know that, how to do that since uh, 23 years. So if somebody, you know, tells you, oh, we can measure precisely lattice parameters. Yes, we can do that since 23 years, you know. And then came the team project along, you know, and that was, uh, you know, the team stands for Transmission Electron Aberration Corrected Microscopes. 
And uh, then it, it provided deep sub angstrom resolution. It terminated in 2009. It gives, yeah, I give you just two examples for that. You know, the one was this germanium 114. You know, uh, you see there's a lot of noise in the image, of course, because you know you need uh, uh, there's 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 motion involved, and I will come to that uh, later. Um, so, but you see, there's always these two white blobs in the images, and these two white blobs they are part 37 picometer. So I think that it was 2009, 20 years later, or no, how much is this now? Um, uh, that is last year, I think, or, or was that, you know, 13 years later, and there was a publication that people say they can make 0.4 angstrom or something like that, right? So it takes 12 years now to go forward and um, uh, go from uh, 47 picometers to 40 picometers. There's a hard limit just simply involved in electron microscopy. You cannot prove on resolution uh, much more. And what team did in essence is um, it also allowed you get atomic resolution images at very low voltages like 80 and 50 and 20 kilovolts and, and these uh, things. And it is very high, you know, I mean, uh, look at the right hand side, there's this uh, spacing of the gallium gallium and the gallium nitrogen. We cannot quite resolve, you know, the gallium gallium and the, the nitrogen nitrogen, but we can resolve this gallium nitrogen spacing. And that is uh, um, at 80 picometers. So that's sub angstrom resolution at 80 kilovolts. And that is something, you know, which came with, through aberration correction within the next generation electron microscope. We made a lot of title pages with, with this type of, type of microscopes. And interestingly, you will find, you know, journals not only in the material sciences, but also in the chemical sciences, like in, uh, uh, you know, angewandte uh, chemie. So chemists became more and more interested in electron microscopy for various reasons. You know. And of course, Zivail, for example, was a chemistry guy. Now, this is just a compilation of, of what you can do, do with this, this type of microscopes. If the material can stand the beam, if it is such, you know, that you do not alter the beam with the very high intense electron beams that you have. You can take apart any material to the last atom. So this is a collaboration that we had with Quentin, you know, on the left-hand side, you know, we have basically these phase contrast images. So you see on the left, there's two structures of, uh, uh, this is boronitrite. This is a double layer of boronitrite. And uh, the top one you see actually, you know, is, is a side view and uh, the, the, the one below it in the model, you know, is, 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 is a top view. And we take one atom out of this particular material. So there is a, a, a boron atom missing, basically. And you see it is in the center of this image. And you see, you know, that's why it is not yellow there, it is green there. So you have created basically a point defect. And you see already that the crystal symmetry is broken. Uh, you see that there is local uh, uh, rearrangement of atoms, you know. Um, so you can study point effects with electron microscopy these days. You can even find out, you know, what the point group is, you know, that goes with this particular um, uh, defect. If you do that experimentally, then there is something which I will come back over and over in this talk again, that nothing stands still in this electron beams anymore. You see that in both of these experimental images, you know, that the whole uh, uh, white and uh, uh, blue and green structure wiggles. It is distorted all the time. So if I take a particular set of images, I get this. And if I take other sets of images, I get something else. You know, it will still show the symmetry because the wiggle, wiggle is small compared to the size of a point defect, but it is always there. Now you can also do spectroscopy with that, and then you can kind of you know look at the edges of boronitrite double layer. You can find out you know whether uh, how the edges are formed. Quentin did a marvelous job of that on, on that type of uh, that uh, uh, material, where you could actually show how the electronic wave functions change you know at the edge of a, a, boron, a folded boronitrite layer. So in this particular case, you know it, the folding is basically it's closed. You know, so. If the material can hold the electron beam, you can take any material apart to the very last atom. And that is, of course, you know, one of the things that um, uh, uh, makes people think how to proceed with electron microscopy, because we cannot go far beyond that. These microscopes are also incredibly stable. 
Now, I cannot play this as a movie, you know, about ground shaking electron microscopy. What you see there on the left is actually gra uh, 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 graphite. And on this graphite, you have small crystals of molybdenum disulfide, and we wanted to see the molybdenum disulfide. It was work that uh, uh, was done, you know, in collaboration with Salda Topsir, with the Galvik. And uh, one of these days, you know, uh, he was kind of taking an image series. And, you know, the time scale we measure in times of earthquakes. So if you look at the bottom, you know, there is uh, um, this, this blue ball, you know, that I can probably more move around here. See, it goes to the right earthquake and then to the left. I don't know how much of these things are transmitted, but you see at the beginning, a perfect lattice image and at the end, a perfect lattice image that is only distorted during the time where the earthquake happened. So, so these microscopes recover immediately after an earthquake, you know, <laughs> if you want to, want to put it this way. And that is a technology that actually kind of uh, 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 is quite amazing. Um, it's built into these microscopes. Um, there is still some need, you know, to be very careful about the environment where you place such an, such an electron microscope. But if you place it in an environment that is, that is uh, suitable, um, you can get easily stability, you know, over hours and hours and hours, that is sub iron strip. I also wanted to show you, you know, what the effects of aberrations are. And for this, I use the simulation and, and you've, you've probably, uh, I've, I've mentioned it before, that the microscope has a property in the, in the objective lens that we call the contrast transfer function. And this contrast transfer function needs to be convoluted with the image of an atom. And that's what you see in the microscope, basically. And so um, if you kind of use the uh, complicated contrast transfer function, it kind of looks at the, as the one you know, on the top. That's for ideal contrast, no aberration. This is every lens does it this way in phase contrast electron microscopy. And you have to pick you know, from left to right, the focus increases. And so you need to kind of partic take, pick a particular focus that is the second image from the, from the right, where you see just the image of the atom without being distorted, right? This is what you want to have in an image. And what you record most of the time is any of these other pictures, and you would not even know which one it is because you can usually not control the focus very well, you know? And so um, um, that is the drawback that needs to, that's what, what, why we kind of uh, uh, use aberration uh, correction. And I wanted to show you what this, you know, aberrations are. So we could talk, for example, threefold astigmatism. And you see what threefold astigmatism looks like. I mean, there's a threefold distortion of the contrast transfer fraction, which makes the atom look threefold in symmetry, right? Or you can put in coma and you see that the atom get a, 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 some tail, you know, that, that is kind of looking as if there's a lighter atom. Or I can even make two atoms out of one atom. This is why aberration correction is so important. So we need to find out the right focus, and we need to find make sure that all this contrast transfer fraction is really uh, um, uh, spherical symmetric, so that uh, there is no artifact in the image, you know, that that you can confuse with the position of other of other atoms. But again, it is only important if you get to very high resolution. So if your work is at lower resolution, you do not need to bother, you know, about an aberration corrector, for example, you know. But you see, the things with the circle, that is also quite bothersome. You know, this is a, a property of the, of, the, of the lens that only vanishes if you have aberration corrected microscopes and if you are at the right focus. Most of the time you're not. And uh, you can show easily, you know, sorry, sorry. And you can show easily how it affects an image. And again, you can take an, one of the four, you know, favorite images, you know, you take, that's our daughter diving with, with the sharks, you know. And so um, you make a Fourier transform of that, and then you can take out of that Fourier transform certain spatial frequencies. For example, if I take the low frequencies out, the frequencies close to the zero beam, you see it's all the black levels in the images that are vanishing. You know? If I kind of you know, take the high frequencies out, I maintain the black levels, but the resolution get lost. I can make a bandpass filter, you know, and then I do both, you know. I get actually, you know, a little bit of uh, 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 the, the black out, wiped out, 
but also, you know, uh, the, the resolution is not that terrific. And the worst case scenario is exactly that if you take such a ring structure out of an image, because then you get this awful image on the right hand side that we actually kind of need to deal with. So this property of the aberration function that you create this uh, zero cross crossing in the, in the, in the Fourier transform uh, leads to image delocalization and massively alters the image. So we need to get rid of that, you know, and we do that since many, many years, since 20 years, how we know how to do that type of stuff. We do that in the exit rate pre-construction process. But that is why it is so, so difficult to interpret an image that is a face contrast image if you do not know exactly where the focus was that you have used. So, what we, what we are after is basically make sure that we kind of can get to the atomic structure, get the, the proper wave functions, get rid of all the aberrations. And for that reason, we actually do holography, you know? Um, and I, kind, I, I show here, you know, uh, 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 the usual holography that you might know from, from wave of the optics. You have basically a coherent plane wave coming in, you know? You have a beam splitter involved. So some of the uh, uh, beam goes directly to the object. The other, the other one takes a detour over the mirror back to the object, and then you interfere them at uh, the detector to form the hologram, right? So that is basically an, a, a procedure to um, uh, uh, find out what the phases are. And uh, once you do that, you have the possibility to actually numerically correct for lens aberrations. So it is basically solving this old problem that intensity is always you know, the product of the uh, wave function types apply star. And if you do such a product, you always lose all phase information and you only recover the amplitude. And that is disastrous because, you know, only the phase information holds the position of the atoms. So that's why you need to kind of recover amplitude and phase of that wave function to actually kind of figure out what, what, the, what the result is. We do that in a little bit different manner. You know, this left in, in the left hand side, you could kind of say it is a parallel uh, uh, hologram. If you, you know, it's it's a simultaneous over overlay of uh, the beam with the diffracted beam. We do this superposition in time. So we basically, you know, have a reference wave just like the other ones too, which is coming into the into the uh, uh, object. That's the blue things. And then uh, we uh, have an uh, exit wave function, which is the red wave, you know, the object wave, if you want to put it that, at the exit phase of the sample. And this is a pair of uh, intensity distributions. And we need to link these two pairs of intensity distribution because then the theorem exists through Gershbeck and, and Sexton, basically, uh, who says then we can kind of, you know, uh, find amplitude and phases. And this, relation we create by making focus series of images. And so we make a certain step or focus step and we do not record one image, we record let's say 10 or 20 or 100 or 1000. And um, uh, then we kind of can calculate from the non focus change in the images, how, how the object wave, the exit waves looks like, you know. So that's uh, 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 what is implied uh, in, in all the images that, that I kind of would show you. Or I've already shown you. And it's amazing what you can do with this type of stuff. Um, first of all, you know, Hector pointed out how we need to be careful with the electron beam. And so the problem with uh, being careful with the electron beam is, of course, if you dim down the electron beam, you have much less electrons. And if you have much less electrons, you hardly see the crystal. And this is, you know, in the box. I don't know whether you see it through the internet or not, you know. Um, there is a crystal in the box, you know, and you would not know that there is a crystal because it is such so much dominated by noise, right? But the beam current is, of course, very low. You know, it's only 19 electrons per square angstrom in a second. And uh, just to give you a calibration, if you do something like an image from graphene that I showed you, this number is 100,000. So we do not talk a small difference. We talk a difference about five orders of magnitude or something like that, right? And that is very, very important if you kind of have sensitive materials. And so um, now you can say, okay, I cannot see something in one image, but I need to make a focal series. So I choose to make 
80 images, you know, and uh, make this uh, focus series restoration from that structure. And then it's like magic. Here is the crystal, right, that you see in this kind of uh, image. So um, you actually can get different orientations of the crystal. You can do that by 80 kilovolt. You can do that at 100, uh, at 300 kilovolt, you know. And these images are spots directly on the atom positions and co fully corrected for lens aberrations because we also uh, uh, imply, you know, numerical face uh, plates to actually correct for the residual lens aberrations. What you get as the result is the image below. So that's from the right-hand side. You may re re see the structure in there. I rotated it a little bit, right? They just overlaid the structure of the material. So it's iron oxide. So there are iron atoms, which are the blue ones, and there are oxygen atoms, which are the turquoise ones. And you can put them on each of the white blobs, and they are exactly where they need to be. And not only that, we can actually calculate from the intensity of these things how many there are. So we can kind of look at such an image and interpret it fully in terms of you know, amplitude and phases, one thing, but we actually can kind of say, oh, it's how many, how many electrons, are, uh, how many atoms are there and what is the type of the atoms that there is. And just to make uh, uh, the point a little bit further, you know, you can, com you can complete this type of measurement with a simulation. And I just put on, on the left-hand side, these are real-world images. These are catalysts, you know, that is rolling tongues, they're catalysts that we uh, image, you know, in, in this particular material some time ago. And then we do a simulations about them. And I have not yet included noise in the simulation to just make sure, you know, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, seen what the simulation and the experiment is. And you see, they are incredibly representative of whatever you have seen there. And you can distinguish what a tungsten atom is from a rhodium atom. And you can kind of look at such an intensity distribution, say, okay, in the top one, for example, we have 166 atoms of rhodium and 54 atoms of tungsten. And this is the chemical composition of this nanocrystal. But for this type of work to occur, you need to have a beautiful microscope, very good microscope, cannot be done in any microscope. Uh, and you have to have you know, uh, a very, very good knowledge about um, uh, how to interpret these images. Yeah. One other thing that comes, in, comes to mind, if you see this, this uh, uh, type of images here is how wide the atoms are. Because as, as Hector pointed out, you know, the width of the atoms is a measure of resolution. And if we have a point and a resolution, let's say from half, uh, from, from let's say 0.5 angstrom or something like that, then um, they should be actually much narrower. So we checked that in several cases, our atom columns are always too wide, which is you know uh, 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 one of the mysteries that are existing in electron microscopy, because nobody has fully understood you know what the processes are that happen in electron scattering. And I will come back to these uh, aspects a little bit later and describe to you know what um, uh, what what uh, uh, what they are. So I just Petra reminded me just that there might be a break in a few minutes or something. I'm a little bit slow here, but I rather go slow than I kind of you know uh, rush through the seagulls. This is what you can get in electron microscopy as resolution. There are two parameters as this dependent that determine the resolution. One is basically what we call information limit, and that is the spread of the, you know, the blur of the function in beam direction. That's what Hector showed, you know. That is, you know, how much you get along the beam, um, an airy disk, you know, that changes with the distance across with the beam, with the within the direction of the beam. But there is also a spot on the surface. You know which kind of has a finite which which we call image spread, and so um, uh, here I've plotted you know for various of these values you know for focus spread and image spread uh, you know the information limit. So the team 0.5 was the best microscope that we ever had. You know it's you see it's something like 0.05 um, nanometer. So it's 0.5 angstrom resolution that you can get with this microscope. Team one was a little bit worse. And that was, you know, because of certain things that they do 
um, uh, that the length of the corrector actually contributes to the, to the uh, resolution degradation. Now, what I've done on the right-hand side also is in the image spread, you can imagine that if atoms shake, you know, then they actually kind of um, create a blur. So for example, you can take the bivolar factors and put it, compare it with image spread. So the, the bivolar factors are typically, you know, something like 10 picometer. And you see this is the width, the length of the error in the bivolar factor at room temperature, which I put up there. That is not longer limited. Sample holder are so good by now, you know, that you actually can kind of have 10 picometer to bivolar factors. So you cannot improve on sample holders because they are already so good that they move less than the bivolar factors, right? To just make it, make it clear. And um, what bothered us with the teamwork microscope was actually the magnetic field noise that kind of increases if you increase the length of the microscope. And that gave us something like 20 picometers. And what we found was most, mostly degrading the material are beam sample interactions. They can be of something like 30 to 40 picometers, depending on how thick the material is, what type of material you have. And they might get incredibly blurred the image. And nobody knows exactly the mechanism how that is happening. But uh, uh, that is definitely the thing that we would have to tackle if we want to further improve on electron microscopy. So to just kind of you know, show you how graphene, for example, looks like. Graphene is one of the most radiation-hard materials, or it is the most radiation-hard material world knows. You know? And so if you hit graphene with an electron beam, I'm pretty sure that you, I don't know what you see there. We published that some years ago, um, uh, and that, that you strip the atoms from the edge of the graphene. So the longer you irradiate, the more atoms you get rid of. So the hole becomes bigger. That is something which you should be certainly seeing there, right? And then we usually draw that on a, on a, on a lattice where the lattice is rigid. And then, uh, you know, you only lose atoms at the edges and nothing else happens. That's of course not true, you know, because if you kind of remove atoms from the, from the, from the edge of the graphene, that's a very violent process. And the whole lattice starts actually, you know, to vibrate and to kind of, to change its uh, position in Z position and XY position. I play that in the other movie below, you know? So, so you have to think about graphene much more as a, as a sheet hopping up and down and kind of, you know, de 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 deploying uh, different positions. And um, we actually kind of made some uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulations to actually show that there are particular sites the atoms like to hop to. You know, that is shown in the right view graph, you know, where you kind of can actually see that there is this atom position A and the position B. And graphene atoms like to be very often in atom B position, which is uh, uh, a little bit off center from, from the atom A. And that makes a hop, you can see that in the, in the uh, uh, view graph, you know, around there's this bump in that blue curve around uh, 50 picometers. So this is something which happens all the time while you irradiate the material. And uh, um, uh, at the moment, nobody knows really how to take care of that. So is that now? Oh, so let's put it, let's put it me in, let's put it this as a let's view, view graph because then we will kind of look at some other aspect. So this is a sheet of graphene that we have, you know, and then you can kind of look at this beautiful image and there are these white blobs, which are the atoms. And there is this black, black area, which is the vacuum. And you can look at the old Greek people who said that nothing exists except atoms and empty space. Everything else is opinion. And this fully, you know, confirms that type of thinking. But there's, of course, time spent between the old Greek and, our, and us nowadays and the view that we have in uh, physics about uh, this type of stuff has evolved. So nowadays, if you want to phrase it something similar, you would say nothing except exists except for wave functions and their interactions. And we need to understand how wave functions interact. That is what actually the key is to understanding any material and that's quantum mechanics. And so we need to kind of move into an area we know where we kind of try to improve our quantum mechanical understanding to actually describe these processes properly. So maybe that's where I take a break. Is that okay? Thank 
Hector? Hello? Is anybody there? Might have gone on the break already. Are they gone already? I don't know. <laughs> He's not responding, but I, I think it's the right time to take a break. I take a break. Okay. <laughs> See yeah. you in a moment. <laughs> so shall we shall we say 15 minutes from now? So yeah. We'll see. I'm sure Hector will uh will tell us or will shout when he comes back. All righty. Let's take a break. Good, short break. I don't know. Where's my printer? Uh, it's a uh, program. Excuse me. Uh, we continue, or are we going to recess? No, just the, the break until um, say eleven twenty-five or eleven thirty. So fifteen twenty minutes. Excuse me. Yes, we, we are taking a break, a recess of 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, okay, 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That sounds good. Okay, then we are back, you know, all of us. And so uh, I have to kick in a little bit of a gear here because I was moving slow. And I will try to kind of do it a little bit faster to give Quentin enough time for his presentation. And um, I, I was stopping at the point where I described how important it is to actually make sure that we understand that the atoms are moving while we record them. And so uh, we do that description in terms of a channeling theory, which is shown there on the left hand side. So what this black and white areas are, are white is where the atom columns are, and we look from the side, and black is where the vacuum is. And then electron waves, you know, are being trapped basically in these columns, and we call that the channeling model. And there are states of the electron wave that are bound, and there are states that are delocalized. And so if we just look at the bound states, the localized 1S states, you know, they have certain properties, and one property is that the electron wave um, oscillates quickly al along the column, you know, if the element is he heavy and very, very slow if the element is light. And uh, that's where the chemical information basically comes from. So if you think about one of these columns, you know, in terms of a static model, you would say, oh, there is noise in the electron beam. So all this uh, lines, you know, how the electron beam oscillates is, is, is so they spread a little bit. This is the noise. Um, but the atom columns are fixed. So every atom stands as its position and stuff like that. But if you kind of look into a dynamic model, you would say, oh, these atoms do not stay at their place. They are moving back and forth. They can even be kicked out, you know, from the column and we lose them. So that's more the dynamic model, which we think is right. And that's where the broadening of the columns comes from. Now, the, re the way how we describe these oscillations is in, a, in, a, in an argon plot, you know, where you basically uh, you can describe an oscillation as a circle. It is in the real imaginary uh, space. And uh, you actually see, I have this uh, black blue circle, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, 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 in this plane. And if you look at the image on top, you know, then you have two things in there. You have a wet shaped sample and the green dots, you know, they are basically atoms positions. And each time I add an atom, you know, because the sample gets thicker, I move along that clock. That's what we call a mass circle. So all we need to do is basically, you know, count the amount of clicks that we have here and we know how thick the sample is. And the other thing that you see is there is this red area, you know, where you have this defocus change. 
And this the focus change allows is a circle, you know, around this atom position, a secondary circle. We call it focus circle, and it is shown there also in the image, you know. And we can change that the focus in the electron in, in the simulation, in the in the in the result of the experiment of the experiment by changing basically um, by propagating the electron wave. And then the question becomes is if I, for example, the position three here. All I need to do is basically propagate the wave so that it intersects with a, a mass circle. And that's what we do. And if you kind of um, uh, uh, produce that, you know how thick the atom is, the atom column is, and you know the um, uh, 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 distance for, of the atom column from the, for, from the imaging plane. And as a result, you can produce these tomographs. So this is for germanium, molybdenum, magnesium oxide, gold. And for each of these things, we can kind of just reconstruct the shape of the crystal with all numbers of atoms accounted for in 3D. So if I kind of, you know, uh, um, I can rotate each of these type of stuff um, that, gives us, that gives us the uh, tomogram. The interesting part of that area is it is from a single projection. Hector described in the beginning, you know, that you need to have different projections, you know, you don't. If you know that the atom is, that material is made from atom, we call this criterion at atomicity, it's a very powerful constraint. And if you apply it, you can get away with one projection three in, and, and reconstruct the three uh, dimensional structure of matter, which is really important because it saves you a dose. Now, this is uh, just the state of the art for molybdenum disulfide, which, you, which came out just is, is on, the, on the verge of coming out or is already out, you know, in, in nature communications. Um, you see, what we did here basically is um, look at molybdenum disulfide and make successive recordings at different times, you know, so make one recording in terms of 53 seconds, the next one is then 400 and 420. And so you add just a time, you know, to the recording while you have irradiated the electron beam. And that shows you several things. One is the sample becomes smaller, so we lose atoms in this kind. Not only that, we lose atoms at the edges which is of course, you know, very disastrous because this is done for catalysis, for example. And uh, the question is then, what is the surface structure of catalytic material for chemistry people? And depending on how much electrons you have used for the recording, you get a certain a different answer. And uh, so we need to control that. And we know how to control that too. And um, the other thing is, of course, we can identify the molybdenum, cobalt, and sulfur, and the vacancy atoms that are in this type of thing, and see how they move around. So we can look at atom dynamics. It's just on a time scale that we would like to accelerate much more. We would like to have not seconds, you know, we would like to have, for example, picoseconds on this time scale and, and, and be able to do it there. The other thing is, you see, the values are there are in EV. So it is fully quantified information. We not, not only know the interpositions in X, Y, Z, we also kind of know the scattering potential, not in phases, but in electron walls. So we fully quantify the information that is available in these uh, 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 images. So now let's go. Not only that, so molybdenum disulfide is actually having three layers of atoms. You know, one is a moly, layer of moly atom, sulfur on top and sulfur on bottom. So you can measure this distance between the uh, uh, moly and the uh, uh, sulfur atoms. And it is done here in four, four, four frames. And that shows you a little bit, you know, how well we can do that. So you see, it, it, it is uh, scattering here at 1.5 angstrom, 1.4 angstrom, 1.4 angstrom, 2 angstrom. So it should be 1.8. So that shows you that from a single projection in beam direction, you can measure the position of atom planes to a precision which is half an angstrom. So our resolution dx, dx, the y and z is <laughs> about the same in all three dimensions from one projection, which is amazing. And that is also something which comes, you know, with the high performance microscopy. So that is not something that you can do with any microscope. And if things become small, of course, you know, um, I was describing that a little bit earlier is if you look, for example, at the movie that I can uh, show you to the left, at the left here, which will probably not be transmitted. 
So I pulled out several frames, you know, uh, and A through C, you know, it's image number two and then image number 71. And to show you just, you know, how these things rotate in the electron beam. But not only that, you see, this is gold. And when gold clusters become small, they look amorphous. So we actually change their structure massively. You know, we have destroyed the, 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 the crystal structure of the material and now created an amorphous material out of the gold crystals. This has nothing to do with the real structure of the material. And I see, for example, you know, um, uh, publications where people say, oh, we can do tomography, you know, on amorphous materials and stuff like that. Yes, you always can do that. But the question is not that you cannot do it. The question is what this, it, what this result shows. It is usually showing a crystal that is heavily modified by the electron beam. Of course, you know, uh, uh, if you make this, this, this low dose recordings, for example, that's shown on the right hand side, show the same crystals, you can actually make this motion stop or this decomposition stop. And uh, that is what we want to achieve. This is why we reduce the electron dose as much as we possibly can. Because the more, the more we reduce it, the more stable the material becomes in electron microscopes. And we know that in, in, intuitively because biologists have told us since ages, you know, that you cannot use more than 20 electrons per square angstrom, you know, otherwise the material is being destroyed. Now, also on the left, you know, we, we just kind of uh, show, you know, how well we can recover focus values. So if you make a focal series, for example, we can kind of make 10 images at the same focus, then step the focus, 10 images at the same focus, and then see how big, you know, the deviations are that from, from, the, from the measurements, uh, you know, in, 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 in contrast to what we had thought we had set, you know. So set is the applied focus, these are the lines, and then, uh, you know, you kind of um, uh, um, uh, have the measurement, which is a dark line, and the deviation is something like, you know, the half width is plus minus one angstrom. This is where all this precision comes from. It's the stability of the electron microscopes that give us, give us this possibility. You know. And now, of course, you know, there is uh, this big issue that uh, uh, most of, many of us, you know, who kind of do material science these days, we do not have clean materials. We very often have composites, you know, we have soft material embedded in hard material and things like that. So the question then is basically, if I kind of, uh, uh, look at the hard material, I can use many electrons, but if I look at the soft element component, you know, I can only use a few. So you need to kind of develop new hybrid techniques that actually allow you to do both, you know, look at the hard material and the soft material uh, component on the same footing. And that is, of course, a little bit difficult. You know, here I've shown some examples. This is basically iron uh, platinum nanocrystals, gold color nanocrystals, which are linked together with all uh, uh, acid linker molecules. And, um, you know, we kind of would like to also understand how the olic acid mo uh, uh, molecules look like, you know. And um, they are, they are uh, altered. But if we reduce the electron beam current, and increase the number of images immediately uh, enormously, then we can get you know to something like image with five atto amperes per square angstrom. I mean, this is uh, uh, you know the pico is, is is already ten to the uh, minus um, uh, uh, twelve, right? And it is below that. You know that is just a few electrons that we actually use for imaging, and we just accumulate enough electrons so that we can see an image. These are just kind of so. If you want to go towards the uh, uh, dynamics of uh, to see the atom dynamics, there's there's certain requirements that you want to have. You know, there's certain desired features. You want to look at interdisciplinary research, soft and hard matter component. You want to capture functional behavior. Um, that means very often you need to have free surfaces and suitable temperatures that you can set. You want to minimize the damage, which is kind of, you know, something we do not, we learn how to do these days and we use time variations for that and quantum effects for that, detectors for that. The recording speed is very, very important, you know, and that makes this one thing in favor of parallel detections. We use, want to have time resolution, so we use pulsed electron beams and we want to have a time resolution from picoseconds to seconds, and that can be done. We want to maximize the signals, so we work with phase contrast, phase splits, it's a correctors. 
And um, uh, we want to have the least amount of projections, which is why uh, we exploit this asymmet uh, atomicity and work from single projections. And we want to do that quantitatively. And the easiest way to do that is actually work with plane waves. And that means phase contrast microscopy. So just to give you a few numbers, you always can get an, in a material image damage field. You know, on the left-hand side, you see you know, this cobalt uh, oxide, and uh, it is imaged you know, at very low magnification at one electron per square angstrom in a second, and you can see beautiful images. The problem only exists if you go to the very high magnification, because uh, then, for example, for graphene, you have more than 10,000 electrons per square angstrom you know, on the right-hand image to get that type of image. And so you see there's a huge gap between these two numbers. The higher the resolution, the more you need to be worried about beam damage you know, that you have. And so uh, uh, if you use electron microscopes, and if you want to make sure that damage doesn't uh, uh, affect you, just work at low magnification and it is fine. Right? But what is needed for sure is that the, you have to adopt this attitude that the control of beam current is not a commodity, but a necessity. You really need to kind of deal with the beam current, carefully watch what the beam current does. And uh, uh, this is very rarely done in electron microscopy. If you just look through literature, very rarely people tell you, you know, what the beam currents were and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So there is this dose gap between, you know, the hard materials and the soft materials, you know. Um, it is about a factor of 500 for carbon atoms and 50 for heavy elements, you know. Um, you can measure it, for example, what you need in terms of what you can tolerate in terms of damage for um, radiation soft matter. That's about 20 electrons per square angstrom. And what it takes, you know, to actually measure a single atom, which is something like 10,000 electrons per square angstrom. So this, this gap has to be closed. Otherwise, we are not able to go to atomic resolution imaging of functional materials if there are components that are hard and soft involved. Now, the good news is you want to do that because, you know, nature keeps a lot of secrets there. Anything that functions, you know, is hidden in this, in this uh, uh, aspect, you know. And it is a fascinating perspective that electron microscopy moves into an area where you kind of can hope to bridge this effect. And the way we do that is basically, you know, we work with low dose rays, we use cryo microscopy, we use phase plates, we use compressed sensing, new cameras, you know, time, uh, time resolved electron microscopy, quantum electron microscopy. So I want to talk a little bit about these aspects now. So there's, of course, a cho the choice of tools, you know, that you have. I think uh, uh, you have the broad beam and you have the focus beam. They all have certain criteria that might be beneficial or, or, or not, you know, and, and it, it, it actually turned out that that is a mixture of both that will probably be the best, you know. So acquisition is, of course, one of the uh, um, really uh, 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 important aspects. And the broad beam does parallel acquisition, the focus beam are serial acquisition. So we are faster with the, with the, with the, with the uh, broad beam, you know. The dose rates, you know, they're incredibly different uh, in these uh, experiments. There is, you know, in, in, in uh, uh, the lowest dose rate that we apply is something like 0 0.01 electron per square angstrom in a second, you know. So that's even lower than what I have here written in the view graph, you know. And it is much, much higher than the, the, the dose rate in, in, in focus beam experiments. On the other hand, the time constants are then compensating for both these effects, you know, because the time constant in, in, in broad beam measurements are 0.1 to 10 seconds, and in focus beam experiments are one microseconds to 100 microseconds per pixel. So you record much faster in, broad, in, in focus beam, but uh, you need to scan a very large area. Now, the minimal uh, spread in beam, the, the minimal spread of uh, intensity in beam direction is much smaller in, in, in broad beam approaches. So it is less than seven angstroms in, in our case. So we can correct these seven angstroms by numerical phase plates and get down to something like, you know, 1.5 angstrom. Um, the detection efficiency in uh, broad beam, it is real space. In, in focus beam, it is reciprocal space. Visibility in uh, broad beam mode, you usually look through the whole sample and see everything. 
if you focus the probe, you actually get sections of the material. So you need to actually kind of uh, uh, build the whole sample, you know, through sectioning of, of um, uh, uh, the material. And the relations to theory is simpler in, in broad beam than it is in focus beam where it is more complex. Uh, you can look at the electron microscope and see, okay, uh, where are the things that I can improve? And there is this gun area, of course, you know, uh, where you can kind of control the illumination. You can pulse the electron beam. That's one point that I would like to address, you know. Then there is, of course, a scattering process, which gets you into quantum mechanics. And you have to understand that too, you know. And then there's, of course, the detectors that have greatly improved and still greatly improved with all these direct electron detectors. So what I want to do in the last few minutes is show you examples how we work on the electron, on the, how we deliver the electrons, you know, how uh, uh, quantum effects are involved, and what the detectors now do. Yeah. So um, this is, you know, just the principle. If you cannot stop the damage, you can also make use of that. You know, this is what you do with a free electron laser. It's called hit and destroy. So for example, if you have, an, if you're, if you have an, a, a molecule that you want to look at and understand the structure, then you could shoot an enormous amount of uh, uh, probing particles at it. You know, they use usually photons, you know, to, for this kind of stuff and, and put in some num numbers. The, the, the beam is so intense, you know, that you have about 10 to the 12 photons in a 50 uh, femtosecond pulse. And that creates a diffraction pattern that you, that you capture. And the moment you create this diffraction pattern, the material is totally destroyed. You know, this beam vaporizes everything, but you have already captured the diffraction pattern. And for that reason, you can kind of get many diffraction pattern from many crystals that you just let stream through the, through the beam that hits it. And from that, people have just kind of shown, you know, uh, how wonderful you can actually reconstruct 50 uh, photosystem too. And so they get the atomic structure of uh, very uh, complex molecules uh, in that, in that uh, way. Now it is challenging to do something like this with electrons because you cannot pack so many electrons in the 50 femtosecond beams because of the Birch effect. And um, it remains challenging for the, for the, for the uh, uh, um, biologists at the same time to see single molecules. So they need to have n different molecules, you know, uh, different molecules and being a pretty big number to actually kind of uh, uh, understand what the structure of the whole molecule may look like, you know. And the assumption is always, you know, that these molecules are identical, which is not necessarily given. So another possibility is, of course, you know, to take it the other way around. You know, you can say basically, okay, I use pulsed electron beams, but I do not uh, try to uh, uh, deliver them in such a huge number that they destroy the material. I just deliver them one by one. So I make pulses of electron beams. Let's say I make one picosecond pulse. That is the blue thing there. And I kind of shoot one electron at the molecule. And maybe it kind of distorts the uh, 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 molecule and breaks a bond or something like that. But as long as this distortion is reversible, it will repair. And if I wait long enough for the repair to occur, I need to kind of can, can redo the whole story and image the same molecule over and over again until I have enough um, uh, images available to see it. And this is what we pursue. And uh, um, uh, that is just an implementation. That's a paper that came out two, two years ago. Um, it's uh, uh, done together with, with Thermo Fisher, actually. Um, they have a test facility over in Eindhoven um, where they kind of build a resonator. And you see it's uh, the white arrow points to the re resonator there. And um, what it does, it basically deflects the electron beam at a very high frequency. So at six gigahertz and this kind of stuff. And that allows you to make pulses of train, uh, uh, pulse trains. And in each of the pulses, you just have a very few electrons, you know. So on the, on the, on the right-hand frame there, you know, you see the typical things that we can achieve. The pulse lengths can be something like 1.4 picoseconds to 14 picoseconds in this experiment. And the delay time is around 160 picoseconds. You know? And so this is what we use to investigate material. And look at that. 
Um, oh, damn it. I have huge problems with my cursor. Um, chopping of the ele electron beam influences beam damage. That's for sure. You know, so uh, if you kind of deliver electrons randomly, we have a we have a hand waving there. Is that true or is that? It's it's true, professor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Related to what what you were uh, telling us about the the time depending uh, pools that you have shown us, shown us. Sorry, uh, there is the the option of do some in situ measurements of, or to obtain some in situ images. For example, if we are making a route of a thin film, something like that, it could be the option to do it in situ, just in the electron microscopy. This is done in the electron microscopy, all of it. Yes, yes but, you can do it to any material. But I mean, for uh, a, reac a reaction in situ, for example, it would be possible to, to make, for example, a, a bead or something like that there in the, in the electron microscope. Well, microscope. See, we, we do not exactly know how the time constants affect a certain material because every material will come with different time constants. We have chosen this one because it shows big effects. You know, that's actually a, a, a double metal catalyst that, that we look at. And uh, um, uh, yes, the hope is basically that you can kind of build a microscope where you have different pulse times and different delay times available so that you can do this effect to any material you want at any time constants you want. But this is, this is a prototype type of thing. It is not yet available, you know, it is something which kind of people develop, but I know that Thermo Fisher works on it, and I know that uh, um, uh, uh, Joel works on it heavily, and uh, I think Hitachi does too. Right. Uh, and, and so related to what you have said, uh, where you have shown some results that are in the order of Armstrong. See, the left hand side is a, is a result. So we or, do not look at images because, you know, the, 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 we wanted to kind of look at diffraction first. We wanted to show how diffraction decays. And that is, of course, then showing you how fast the material is destroyed. And as you can see, you know, in the frame B, for example, that if we reduce the beam current, that if, you know, we increase very much this, this value that is, that is it's the slope of the decay, and then we reduce the damage to the point where it is in this, where shrinking of what is happening is that if you make damage, you shrink the sample. And if the sample shrinks, you cannot put the images all together and you're screwed, right? And so you want to kind of reduce the beam current so much that there is no shrinking of the sample. And you see, we reached that point. If we just go down to a beam current of, let's say, you know, one picoampere or below into a certain area, of course, you know. I imagine that would be the, yes, tell me. Sorry, sorry. I, I was saying, I, I imagine that's the limit that we can obtain in, in microseconds or what would be the, the limit to, so that is something micro. we can't uh, currently explore exploring. Nobody knows what the limits are of these materials. Nobody. Oh. That. <laughs> there is no limit. <laughs> it's brand new. It's it's some, something that people kind of would like to understand and have no clue how to actually kind of deal with it. So a good thing to do then is basically make a measurement and try to find out, you know, what, what you learn from this measurement. You know? And this is a, a measurement from DMC. And what you could see that you um, can massively in, 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 uh, uh, affect, you know, the destruction of the material by just pulsing the beam. All right. Okay. Thank you. Same kind of, you know, from the work of uh, uh, Flanagan. So that's, uh, you know, uh, um, the approach that the Weil took, you know, with shining light on the pulse probe material uh, experiments. Also, they see that they affect, you know, basically the decay of diffraction spots in this case. So it is something that you can do in any material with any electron microscope. It's very general. And it doesn't matter who does this type of stuff. It is always there. The only question is, you know, so what are the time constants and how do they relate to basically the material that you look at? So we are working with pulsed electron beams, but then the other question is also basically, how low can you go? 
how many, so what is the lowest amount of electrons that you can shoot at the material and still learn about the structure? And there was years ago, you know, there was actually this, uh, this uh, double slit experiment, you know, Young's double slit that was first done with optics. And then Hannes Licht, Hannes Licht did that actually, and other people, John Mora and, and um, uh, Jönsson. And they kind of showed, you know, that if you use an electron wave and shoot just one electron at the sample, then you will get somewhere a diffraction spot, a white spot on the camera. And it will be always one spot. And the problem is, you know, that how do you then understand what, what, what the object looked like? So you need to have enough electrons shot at this one at a time, you know, to create um, intensity distribution that shows that distribution of a double slit. And so this is shown in this uh, time series, T1, T2, T3, in the bottom images, where you have just accumulated enough electrons, you know, to actually um, uh, uh, see that you get the diffraction pattern of a double slit. And uh, the amazing thing about this whole story is that each time you shot an electron, it is actually one electron. And so every electron knows, you know, where it needs to go through and that it went through a double slit. So it has, you know, interfered with, it, with itself. So that self-interference of electrons that actually you see here. And the question is, can we do that? Can we use that with, with material science too? And the answer is yes, we can. So this is the same experiment just done with a diffraction pattern. So you shoot an electron in the, uh, into the material and you see actually you know, the uh, atomic columns that we describe as cylinders. There's an electric field in the atomic columns. You know, the electron waves get trapped in there and each electron that goes through knows where it needs to go into the diffraction pattern. And on the right hand, right hand side, you see that, uh, you know, I needed to kind of blow up the whole diffraction pattern a little bit. So the zero beam is in the lower left corner where you see zero beam. And then there's some noise in the background, but each of the white blobs is one electron, not more. So this image holds just images of one, two or three electrons and others, nothing else, right? And then you see, for example, the one, one, all diffraction spots emerging by an accumulation of one electron in a certain area. And for example, the 200 you cannot see yet because not enough electrons were accumulated in that area. So that is the ultimate detection limit where we do not talk about uh, uh, um, the, the ensemble of, the, uh, of what el all electrons do. We look actually at the self-interference interference of single electrons. And uh, the beam current is in this kind of in this experiment, you know, uh, 10 to the four electrons per second. That's two femtoamps that we used in this, in this uh, particular experiment. That's five, five orders of magnitudes lower than what you see in the usual diffraction pattern, you know, the ones that Hector was describing to you earlier, you know. And it gives you access to quantum mechanics. So we actually kind of work in this limit to actually understand how electron scattering works in the ultimate detection limit. Now, there's one thing, you know, I, you can kind of, uh, and, and then people ask me very often, you know, how can you, how can, where is quantum mechanics involved in that? Where's the Heisenberg principle and stuff like that? And you can, you can make a very nice exercise to actually go for it. And uh, 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 this is just the principle shown here is, see, if you have a wave and you kind of look at a sine wave over a certain distance, so that is on the left top, for example, that's a sine wave there. And I've just altered the wave vector a little bit, you know, so I've kind of made E different waves with slightly different wave vectors. And you see how you, how you kind of destroy the, the you, you can get um, uh, uh, constructive interferences and destructive interferences. Now, if you just do it in the right amount of manner, then you actually kind of add them up all, then you actually create a wave package. That is shown on the right hand side. So the right hand side is just the addition of all these different waves from the left hand side. And if the phase shifts between each of the waves uh, becomes too large, it just you know, destroys all the, the information and there is nothing. And if it is small enough, you see a wave package basically. This is what you need to think about a single electron. You, know, you need to divide it up into subwaves and this subwaves interact with the crystal and therefore the electron behaves like a wave package and not like a you know, infinite wave. 
And you can actually calculate these things by saying, okay, I do not want to have all different wavelengths considered. I just look at two. And this is, this is on the bottom left, you know. So I have two waves and you see they have a different wave vector and the more they oscillate, the bigger the phase shift becomes. And I can calculate how big the shape phase shift is, you know. So for example, I can just take the usual wave, you know, subtract, you know, the uh, uh, wave that is actually kind of having different wavelengths. And I can uh, multiply that with a number, which I call coherence length. And that gives me the total phase shift, right? And now the question is, what do you choose as the number for the total phase shift? And magically in this new graph, you know, I've decided to call that 0.5 radian, right? And I will come to a moment why this 0.5 radian is so damn important, you know? Now you can think about this, you know, as electrons, you know, with having a different wavelengths being delivered. But you can also think about it this way that you say, oh, there's of course the de Broglie wavelengths of electrons. I have 300 kilovolts, so it's 1.9 picometer wavelengths, you know, which is relativistic. And if I kind of have a scattering process now in the sample, the electron changes its wavelengths a little bit and thereby produces a wave package. And that coherence length that comes in there depends then actually on the energy loss in the sample. And you can calculate that for any energy electron loss, the loss of whatsoever you want, you know? And now look at this. There's a coherence length on the left. There is the energy loss. I normalized it to one EV, you know, so, so that it is for one EV written basically. And you see the higher the energy loss. So the more you go to the left-hand side, you know, the shorter the coherence length will be. And so, uh, for example, you know, if you go at uh, 10 to the minus three, so to so a thousand EV loss, the coherence length is one angstrom. If you go there to a million volt or something like that, high energy particles or whatever, they will never be a wave because the coherence legs will be so short that we must treat them as particles. And this is what people do in high energy physics, right? On the other hand, you go to the right hand side. So you go to these losses that are, let's say 100 milli electron volt, 10 milli electron volt phonons, for example, you know, the coherence length becomes incredibly large. You know, it is 10 to the minus four meters, 10 to the minus five meters, right? So if you go further along this line to very, 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 very small energies, the smallest energy that we know is gravity. Gravity is described as the wave. It will never be a particle, right? So what you see here is basically, you know, how the interaction between wave functions creates a coherence length that is very important for physics. Now, why 0.5 radiant phase shift or something like that? So you see, this is calculated for this 0.5 radiance of shift. And I just take the coherence length and I divide it by the speed of light. Then it is, you know, length divided by meter per second, it's then seconds, right? And that's shown on the right-hand side. It's now a coherence time, just by division by the speed of light. And the rest stays the same. But then you, you have basically a plane, which is, you know, in essence, energy versus time. And that is the Heisenberg principle. And in fact, if I go, you know, to a, an energy loss of one EV, it gives you the Heisenberg constant H bar, which is something like, uh, you know, six times 10 to the 16. So what that view graph suddenly makes is it splits the world into the real world that we know and in the world of the quantum mechanics which is the uh, reddish world, you know, down there. And in quantum mechanics, we know quite a bit, you know, about certain principles that we assume. For example, we say there is coherent elastic scattering or with incoherent inelastic scattering, but that exists as a principle in the quantum mechanical world. What exists in the real world does not seem to be the case. In the real world, it seems to be such that all scattering is coherent, but inelastic. So that's the black line. That's the division between quantum mechanics and the real world. And what we currently do is we try to understand, you know, how you move between worlds, you know, up and down and from quantum mechanics to, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, to particle physics, if you want to put it this way. 
and there is a there is a huge impact on on our understanding you know of what what we think about electron microscopy so for example if you open a book about electron microscopy first chapter that you see coherent elastic scattering for electron microscopes well my point would be that it perhaps does not even exist if all scattering is coherent but inelastic that's a that's a misconception it exists as a principle in quantum mechanics but does not apply to the real world same story for incoherent inelastic scattering in fact there are experiments out there that already show that incoherent inelastic scattering does not exist because there is this work from Carbius around, you know, showed that there's lattice imaging that you can do, which is impossible if you have incoherence. Um, this just showed, you know, that uh, you um, long, go along these lines in two work, actually, you know, from 2000 and uh, 2011. And you see, it all confirms so far that electron scattering is always coherent but inelastic. And that is something which is kind of entirely new, has to be in, included in all these time resolved measurements that we do, because we need to understand on the time scale what actually you know the principles of electron scattering is there. And with that, I would like to stop and just summarize a little bit. You know, electron microscopy has uh, been around for 90 years now and improved steadily. It has turned out, you know, that beam sample interactions are really the limiting factor these days. If we do not address that, we produce results that people interpret in ways that may be an overinterpretation, you know. And at the forefront of controlling this type of say, of, of, of uh, 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 effects, you have pulsed electron beams, you have the improvement of detectors, you look into quantum mechanics, you know, and try to understand quantum mechanical processes. And all that we do to make interdisciplinary research into functional behavior at high spatial temperature, uh, spatial temporal resolution. And if I talk high, you know, I mean one picosecond, one angstrom, and that will become feasible. Within, uh, you know, the next year or two, we will have images, you know, showing effects at one picosecond and one angstrom. So thank you very much for your attention. And that's uh, why electron microscopy is so exciting. <laughs> thank you. The questions. Hector, is there any other question? I don't know if Hector is here. Pardon me? I said I. I he looks like he's muted, so I don't know if he's there. But I don't see any raised hand. Me neither. Then I, I hope I have accelerated enough to actually give, give you enough time to kick in to be here. That was quite fast. Um, Hello, Doctor. I have one question. Can you listen to me? Yeah, please. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, do you also use holography in your laboratory? Because in the starting, you told us about, a few about holography. So um, I have really have difficulties to understand you. Can you repeat? Hello? Can you repeat? If I can maybe. If I understood the question right, and that you'll correct me, I think the question was, do you also apply the same um, holography, so exit wave reconstruction to those oh. uh, pulsed of uh, images? Of course. Of course. Hopefully I got the question right. Correct me if I was wrong. Yeah. Because then you can drop, you know, the beam current enormously, and you just, you know, take uh, hundreds of images, you know, and add them together in an exit wave reconstruction process, and you kind of do not change the material. See, the currents, how we get low down to is something like 0.1 electrons per square instrument in a second. But then we just take 10 minutes recording time. And it's still doable. And you do not destroy anything. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, my, I think my connection was lost. 
can i ask again my question uh, yeah 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 in the starting you talk about uh, a few uh, about holography so uh, do you also have this instrument uh, and uh, is it possible to use in your laboratory can you write it down or it's, it's i really don't understand it Okay. I think you might have a prospective collaborator asking if uh, you have an instrument capable of doing this and if people can come and collaborate no, no, at your no, lab. No. <laughs> I, see, I see, I see, I see, I see. The thing is, you know, these, these instruments are all prototypes that we work with. And uh, the closest that we have, you know, uh, that does all this kind of experiment was a team one or is the team one microscope because it has, you know, the CC corrector, it has, you know, the monochromator on top of it, it has this Nelsonian illumination scheme, you know, and all this help, you know, to actually kind of make these images. So many of the experiments we used with the team one microscope and uh, 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 some other experiments in particular, if we use pulse beam, we collaborate. But with prototypes, that's not, that's not, but the prototypes are the next, generation electron microscopes that will hit the market. You know, it's like the spectrum of every, you know, of a spectrum of, of, of a Thermo Fischer, you know, or something like that. Okay, thank you, Doctor. I think there's another raised hand from Ivan, or is that again, uh, something that le was left uh Yes, please. Uh, Professor, according to what you have uh, said, what would be the main challenge to, to solve to obtain a better sp spatial temporal resolution? What would be the most important aspect to, to solve? If you could see, for example, the folding of a molecule would be well lovely. If you can stimulate in real time through the electron beam, a folding of a, mo of a molecule would be lovely. You know? This is the, one of the most fundamental processes in biology, you know, how a, how a molecule folds. And what would be the, the path to, to follow to, to obtain that? Oh, even if I would know, you know, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but I honestly do not yet know because we learn as we go along, you know. And, and so to get to this point, it took us many, many years, you know. And so I'm pretty sure that we understand certain things more than I've represented them here. But on the other hand, you know, it is very clear that there are so many unknown things in electron microscopy, in particular if it goes into the quantum regime, that, that to make predictions would just be very, very inhonest, you know, no, no, no. So it will be complicated to give an average time to, to obtain that These resolution. things are complicated. There will not be, a, remember the view graphs that I showed in the beginning, you know, Abbey electron microscopy is fast and easy and stuff like that. Not true. They are complicated and it is kind of, you know, uh, uh, you have to have knowledge about that type of stuff. And you cannot move forward without a very solid knowledge in electron microscopy. So it can be decades or something like that to, to, to have that commercially. <laughs> um, I think that will be coming closer. You know, I think people already uh, asked companies, you know, to sell them electron microscopes with pulsed electron beams. And, and that will be happening. They just kind of bought one in Hong Kong, I think, you know. I know that in, in, in Switzerland, they are kind of interested in getting into this area, you know. And so um, uh, there are several places on Earth where they already start buying these things. Okay, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. No further questions? Yep. Oh, there's one from Martha. Yes. Um, hi, Professor. I'm a graduate student from engineering, so I must say I don't have a lot of experience with uh, this kind of techniques. But on my thesis, uh, we used a stem microscopy. I didn't. I didn't run the sample, but 
I have some questions about it. For example, is there, is there a way or do you use a software where you can see like the inter, interlaminar or interplanar spaces between the materials? And if so, how do you how do you make the difference? Like how are you sure that what you're seeing in in your spectrum is like atomic arrangements or are just interferences from the equipment? See, if you use this stem, then you usually look at the inelastic scattering. And uh, Quentin will be happy to point out that in this kind of experiments, it's much easier to interpret the images because you do not have this interpret uh, this interferences of beams. So if you have a stem image that shows these uh, fringes between you know uh, different different planes, you can be more certain you know without a software you know to kind of uh, 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 interpret it in, in this manner. So in that respect, stem is easier to interpret since long people know that you know because. It is basically showing contrast from inelastic scattering. It's uh, it's 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 uh, uh, easier to interpret. Okay, thank you so much. Anybody else? Doesn't look like it. You are on, my friend. <laughs> I suppose I am. Yes, I was gonna wait until Hector came back, but uh, I suppose I'll, uh, I'll take over then. Yeah, I'll take over. I need to, may, I may need to lock out, you know, because I kind of, I to totally have lost my, lost my cursor and, uh, you know, I need to. I'm, 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 I'm sure ah, we'll see you back. Okay. So let's see if yes, I can I am, share I am back. my screen. Uh, there. So, okay, hopefully you can see. Uh, back a couple of slides. There you go. Great, excuse hopefully me. The, the screen goes through. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, uh... Could you tell me what time we finish? Um, I'm hoping to be finished in about an hour and 15 minutes. So it'll be 1.30, I think, Cancun time. One hour? No. Uh, a, little bit, a little bit more than one hour, an hour and 15 minutes. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll, I'll try and speak fast. I usually already speak fast. Um, so. If there's anything that uh, is not clear, uh, same as with uh, Christians and Hector Storks, please uh, stop me or raise your hand or, or shout. Uh, it's, it's not always obvious that there's a, a raised hand, so don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, so we've not had real introductions, so I'll just uh, introduce myself. My name is Quentin Ramas, I'm the director of the SuperSTEM Laboratory. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, we are based uh, in England. Um, uh, but we've been collaborating for a long time and I used to work with Christian quite a few years ago now, uh, realizing that it's almost 20 years ago that since we, uh, since we met, so time flies. Um, so very briefly, just to show you where we are and where I'm speaking to you from, that little red dot between Manchester and Liverpool, and just like the National Center for Electron Microscopy in the Molecular Foundry, uh, the laboratory that I work at is called SuperSTEM, uh, and we'll, we'll come to that name in a second, but it is also uh, a national facility uh, and a user facility where people can come uh, and use the instruments that we, uh, that we have uh, and essentially just collaborate. I usually describe it as uh, having toys that uh, all our friends can come and share and play with. Um, it, it's uh, the nice thing about those expensive instruments. Uh, they only produce the right results if you have lots of people to come with uh, different ideas uh, and, and share them uh, all together. I'm not going to tell you too, too much about the laboratory itself. I just want to go back to that one point because it was raised several times uh, uh, this morning. Um, both Christian and Hector and, and I will, of course, tell you a lot about our microscopes. These are our babies. We love our uh, 
big toys, expensive toys. Uh, but of course, you can only do microscopy in the context of a larger ecosystem. Uh, and we spoke this morning about the need for sample preparation. So that's also extremely important. Um, and that's also, of course, resources that you have to share. You have to find ways to make samples uh, uh, that uh, are thin enough and a good quality so that the microscopes can actually uh, produce the results that they're capable of. Um, and also things that Christian was talking about towards the end of the talk also, uh, modeling and theory and understanding what you're seeing is increasingly more important. Um, it's one thing to record an image or a spectrum. Uh, it's another to understand the physics and sometimes the very complicated physics uh, that is behind. And so it's really only when you put the three of these uh, together that, that you, you can solve your materials, physics, chemistry, or, or uh, engineering problems uh, with the microscope uh, at its center. So uh, what are we uh, going to be talking about? Uh, you'll see in the first few slides, um, somewhat of a repetition almost of things you've heard already, similar concepts, uh, similar view graphs, just with a slightly different twist on it. Um, I always say that's good. That's how uh, uh, teaching is supposed to be done. You repeat the same thing with slightly different points of view and hopefully there's something that sticks or it, it triggers uh, uh, a way of understanding what maybe you hadn't understood the first time around. So the apology of some of it uh, is a little bit of a repeat. Uh, hopefully I'll put on my own twist on it, uh, in particular on the historical perspective or on the concepts of reciprocity or wave optics. And then we'll really focus uh, on the STEM before also talking about yields and spectroscopy, uh, which is uh, something that I've added in this tutorial in the last couple of years, just because it was very heavy on imaging. And uh, because I work at a laboratory that does mostly STEM and STEM yields, I was feeling rather sad not to be able to show you some electron energy loss spectroscopy as well. So I'll make sure to include some time uh, to talk to you about STEM and STEM yields. Right, so something that we've uh, all seen, uh, and I'm, I'm just putting that again uh, uh, to give you my own perspective on this. Uh, we all know why we use electron microscopes. We use electron microscopes because the wavelength is just right uh, to go and look at very small features of the size uh, of an atom or an atomic column. So uh, if I can put my laser pointer on. Uh, yeah, hopefully that moves. Uh, the electron microscope, the electron wavelength, when the electrons are accelerated to something like 60 kilovolts or six, uh, to 300 kilo electron volts, is just about the right size uh, to fit an atom between, or an atomic column between two of these oscillations. And therefore you're able to distinguish between atomic columns that are separated by your typical interatomic spacing. But the reason I'm showing this really is twofold. First of all, uh, to remind you that the reason electron microscopes are so popular is because they're cheap, uh, certainly compared to, to a synchrotron or, or to a neutron scattering uh, uh, spallation source, for instance. Uh, uh, but also remind you of a concept that I think is central to, to all we do. Even though uh, Hector talked a lot about uh, crystallography and reciprocal lattice uh, and uh, diffraction and, and scattering, um, in my mind at least, electron microscopy is a lot about symmetry interrupted. The reason we use a microscope is because we want to go and look at things that are not repeated in large numbers of units. Otherwise we could use larger scale characterization like synchrotron again, uh, X-ray, X-ray diffraction. Uh, the beautiful thing about microscopy is you can go and look at one particular small detail of a sample, which is perhaps of interest um, with of course the understanding that by only looking at a small piece of material, you don't have a more global view uh, of your material. So you need again, all those different techniques to give you uh, a multi-wavelength or multi-length scale, sorry, uh, uh, picture of, of, uh, of materials or of the problem you're, you're trying to solve. Um, and in that respect, this is the reason why I personally uh, use STEM, scanning transmission electron microscopy, so S-T-E-M, the T-E-M is uh, uh, the, the usual part and we're adding the scanning in the way uh, I describe it is, uh, I call it the ultimate analytical tool. You don't have to believe me or you don't have to take this at face value. Um, I work at a lab called SuperSTEM, so of course I will say STEM is the ultimate tool. Um, what matters is that it is the tool 
that answers your question. And if STEM is that one, then great. Um, uh, but there are, of course, lots of other tools available uh, to all uh, scientists around the world to, uh, uh, to solve their materials problem. Another way, perhaps, to describe it is a STEM, a dedicated STEM, or, or, or a STEM mode in a, in, a, in a temp STEM, is sort of like a scanning electron microscope, an SEM on steroids. Um, it's exactly the same principle as a, an SEM in a scanning probe technique. Um, so the principle of it is extremely simple. You have a source of electrons that shoots out uh, a bunch of electrons out. Uh, in my case, I'm uh, drawing it coming from the bottom, going towards the top. So that's for historical reasons. Uh, but otherwise, the gun would normally be at the top. You have then some sort of lens. And if you have a lot of money, you can buy expensive lenses, including aberration correctors, which will help to refocus the electrons onto a spot, a tiny spot at the sample. And again, the more money you put into this, the more complex the lens is or the lens arrangements is. Um, and typically, the smaller you can make this uh, electron probe. So uh, uh, Christian was talking about TMO5 and TIM1 microscopes. The size of the probe uh, in those cases is typically of the order of, uh, say, half an angstrom uh, or certainly below one angstrom. And uh, if you remember that the typical size of an interatomic spacing in most crystals is over one angstrom uh, in, in most of the large, uh, uh, the main zone axis projections. That means that your probe size is smaller than the, the interatomic distance, and you can really go and look at individual atomic planes or atomic columns. Then you put a sample. That sample needs to be reasonably thin, thin enough that electrons can traverse through it. Um, and uh, let all this scattering or this uh, uh, magic, uh, I didn't say magic, I meant physics, um, happen. And once physics happens, then you can collect all the information using a bunch of detectors on the outside uh, after the sample. In the most simple of incarnations uh, for, for stems, for uh, just a stem, you don't need any lens after the sample. All you need is detectors that are positioned in the right uh, uh, area of the post field scattering. Um, but of course, if you have extra money, you can uh, buy also a microscope that has extra lenses afterwards, which make uh, things a little bit easier because you can recombine those electrons post samples and put them in the right places where you want them to be. Typical detectors that you would have in a stem um, are this blue disc detector, the name of which you will have heard uh, many, many times. Uh, it is an annulus. It's round with a hole in the middle. You can see the hole here in pink. Um, and it's called an annular dark field detector. It's dark fields because you're not collecting the bright field disc, the straight through uh, diffraction disc. You're just looking at the electrons that have been scattered to high angles um, or to reasonably high angles. And the reason you do that is because these electrons have been scattered mostly off the nucleus of the atoms in your sample. So it's somewhat like Rutherford scattering. And if you remember your first course in quantum mechanics, first year of university, Rutherford scattering is roughly dependent on the atomic number of the scattering center. And therefore, the heavier the element or the heavier the material, the more electrons are going to land on this detector. And therefore, it's going to appear bright in your image. And that's a typical example of a double wall carbon nanotube. So it's a little noisy because there's not very many atoms in uh, this wall of carbon. And you see one wall of carbon here, another one wall of carbon there. And right down the middle of this carbon nanotube, you see bright dots. And these dots are single atoms, so just one atom of cesium, iodine, cesium, iodine, cesium, iodine. How do I know they are cesium and iodine atoms? Well, I can look at the Contrast, if you squint a little bit, I don't know how easy it is to see through uh, your screen and through the, uh, um, uh, through the internet. You can just about see that this guy here is a little less bright than this bottom atom there. Um, and with a little bit of calculations in the theory, you can realize which one is cesium and which one is iodine. Of course, it has a different uh, atomic number, so 55 and 57. And so they should have different scattering properties. But you have a simpler way of doing this. You can also look at those electrons that have not scattered to high angle, but have gone straight through the optic axis and send them through an eel spectrometer. These electrons that have not been scattered off the nuclei 
that have still gone through the material, they may have um, somehow bumped into some of the electrons of the material around the atoms that are zooming around. And uh, in doing so, they will have lost a little bit of energy. They will have decelerated or changed wavelength, if you wish. Um, and uh, this is what we call this technique energy loss spectroscopy, because the electrons that we collect through the middle, through that detector that has a bending magnets to select for energy, uh, have lost a certain num uh, amount of, of energy. And you can uh, draw this as a histogram if you want. So most of the electrons will have lost absolutely zero energy. That's called the zero loss peak. And we'll talk about this towards the end of the talk. Um, and then at certain energies, you have characteristic peaks that correspond to ionization uh, events. So again, an electron from the probe hits an electron from the sample, loses a little bit of energy. The amount of energy is quantified uh, and it's typical of carbon, for instance, you need to lose 285 electron volts worth of energy uh, to uh, set up that transition. And then that shows up as a peak in your yield spectrum. Those of you who are more familiar with X-ray absorption spectroscopy, that's exactly the same principle uh, to uh, a first approximation at least. So the energy losses in XAS are the same as the energy losses in yields uh, to an extent. And if you draw the map of uh, here, the energy loss specific for cesium or the energy loss specific for iodine, you can definitely see that you have one atom of iodine, one of cesium, one atom of iodine, one of cesium. And of course, it corresponds to these bright lights that you have all the way here. So one thing that I, I should have emphasized, and I'm spending quite a bit of time on this view graph just because that's setting the scene for the rest. And then we can go a little bit faster for a lot of the other uh, slides after this is, um, the reason it is interesting to do this uh, in the STEM mode is, of course, because your probe is small, you're interrogating just one small spot of your samples. So for instance, if there were an atom missing here and if your probe were on that uh, uh, spot where there's no atom, you'd, you'd see no scattering and you can really go and probe or interrogate defects. Again, symmetry interrupted. Uh, but the, the downside of this is you have to scan the beam across a, a certain area of your sample. This is why it's a scanning probe technique. So all these images are acquired pixel by pixel in that you put the sample. So the probes, sorry, for instance, here at this position where there's no nothing, it's just vacuum and you collect the information then you move it to the next spot. You collect the information and you do this serially. So it takes a little bit of time to build the entire picture. Uh, the nice thing about this geometry is, as I said, you can collect an image, you can collect an energy loss spectrum, but you can also collect any other type of scattering. And if you remember the, uh, uh, the slide that both Christian and Hector showed with lots of arrows going in all sorts of direction, explaining to you what signals are available uh, from a single scattering experiment uh, 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 with an electron impinging on a sample, where there's all sorts of uh, scattering signals that you can collect, eels, but also a secondary process uh, whereby uh, some X-rays are emitted, so that's uh, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which is the same as you would find in SEM, except in this case, we're doing it with a probe that is the size of an atomic column, so atomic resolution X-ray spectroscopy. Other secondary processes uh, involving different types of phonon, uh, pho photons, sorry, so uh, X-ray photons for EDXS, so in this case, cathodoluminescence, so photons in the visible, uh, that's work from a group in Paris where you can see different quantum disks uh, emitting light uh, at different wavelengths uh, on the uh, scale of about a nanometer also. Um, and you can also collect secondary electrons. And if you're really interesting, uh, interested in uh, uh, looking at uh, everything at once, you can also remove all those detectors, put a camera in the far field, so all the way out here, so remove the dark field detector, remove the bright field detector, don't put a Neil spectrometer, just put a camera and collect the entire diffraction pattern at each point on your sample. And this is what people these days call four-dimensional STEM or 4D STEM, uh, simply because at each point on the sample, and of course there's two dimensions, X and Y on the sample, you collect a two-dimensional diffraction pattern in, in uh, uh, momentum or, or, or reciprocal space, QX and QY, and therefore that becomes a four-dimensional STEM dataset. So enough uh, uh, of an introduction. Um, 
just a little bit uh, going backwards in terms of, of history and, and the origins of STEM. These are things that you've seen already. I just want to draw your attention perhaps to uh, two very useful references if you're not familiar with them in particular, the Nobel Prize lecture from Ernst Ruska, uh, which was published in Angevante Chemie uh, uh, quite a few years later, but it is a, a very interesting read with a lot of uh, uh, anecdotes and, and pictures. Um, and, and one of the anecdotes that you actually find in, in that particular paper that I always found fascinating was the fact that when Knoll and Ruska uh, started working on the first TEM, that had actually no idea about the work of De Bruyne in Paris and about the fact that uh, the electron could also be considered as a wave, uh, which is the reason why they were very surprised all of a sudden to see that their microscope had even better resolution. So uh, just uh, uh, as an aside, it goes to show that uh, sometimes serendipity uh, and doing things just because they're interesting uh, ends up working out, um, as my own PhD supervisor used to say, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. I don't know if that was a, a compliment on my work uh, or, or just a, a comment on the, the nature of life. Uh, anyway, to go back to my story, uh, Manfred von Arden, whose name uh, Christian also showed in his historical perspective, is the inventor of the first stem, roughly only a couple of years after uh, the TEM was invented, so 1933, first electron microscope, 1938, first STEM, but really um, the father of modern STEM and the name that I wanted to spend just a, more, a, a couple more minutes uh, discussing is uh, a person called Albert Crewe. Uh, and that's a lot of years later, uh, that's in the 1960s. And Albert Crewe really is the father of modern STEM. He was not a microscopist, he was uh, an, a high or particle physicist, a high energy physicist. He was the director of Argonne National Laboratory in the US. Um, but he had an interest in microscopy, and his interest was uh, in developing a new kind of contrast mechanism, taking advantage of energy losses, that electron energy loss spectroscopy that I was telling you about. Uh, the only issue is the electron guns that were available at the time had very, very little usable current. So what uh, he and his team did was to invent a completely new type of electron gun. He's the inventor of the cold field emitter, uh, which is now, uh, I suppose, the gold standard for uh, electron emitters in, in most microscopes these days. Um, and that gave him a lot more brightness, a lot more current, and allowed him uh, to do uh, uh, yields. But he also put together a lot of other concepts, in particular, the concept of a dedicated stem, uh, whereby, again, you'll recognize this is a figure taken from this paper in 1966, but it looks exactly like the little diagram that I showed you uh, just a few minutes ago of the, uh, the basic stem, whereby you only have a field emission source, a source of electron, a lens impinging on a specimen with a scanning system somewhere in the middle, and everything then goes through the energy analyzer to look at the uh, energy loss uh, spectroscopy. In that same paper in 1966, I should also note, uh, was not only uh, all sorts of uh, optimization for how the cold field emitter should be set up, but also the diagram for a aberration corrector of a certain type called a quadruple optical aberration corrector. That was a concept that was around since the 1930s also, but um, that he uh, put in practice. Um, so in that one paper, essentially you have cold field emission source, aberration corrector, electron energy loss spectroscopy, and uh, applications thereof. And uh, a few years later, I should say, Here's Albert Cree himself pointing at pictures that he and his then postdoc, Joe Wall, uh, had taken. Uh, and these bright dots that you see here in 1972 are images of a single uranium atom on a thin carbon film. So uh, not so very long ago, we we're all super happy to see again single atoms. Um, it, techniques and the principles uh, have been around for, for, for a little while. Right, enough with history, perhaps let's uh, move on. Uh, and I'll just remind you in two minutes of this concept that Christian also introduced uh, of the reciprocity theorem um, or the reciprocity principle, which essentially tells you that all you know about electron microscopy, TM in parallel beam mode, uh, you can also understand it in STEM uh, version just by considering that one is the opposite or the upside down version of the other. And that all goes from the fact that if you have 
the nautical system is just an optical theorem. And if you send some sort of light or some sort of signal through that optical system from left to right, assuming there are no losses and assuming there is no inelastic event through the system, and you've already pointed out surely that this is the problem here because we clearly have inelastic losses, uh, inelastic events in our electron microscopes. But nevertheless, if you assume there are no losses, you can go from left to right and arrive at this point. Uh, but then if you reverse the uh, path, you can go from right to left and then arrive at exactly the same point, uh, which means that you can put a TM upside down and build a stem. And I'll show you uh, how this is done. And this is a, a diagram that you have seen many, many times in all sorts of uh, textbooks, whereby in a TM, you have a gun and then you create the plane wave that goes onto the sample. At this point of the sample, this one single electron, so at the moment, I'm only looking at this one electron that is part of this plane wave, interacts with the sample, scatters, and then you create uh, an image further down using an objective lens. But of course, because all these electrons are coming down at the same time, it is quite efficient in terms of time. You can eliminate a slightly larger area. Every single point has its own diffraction or scattering process, and then you can recombine everything into an image uh, at the bottom. But if you invert the path, start from the bottom and go to the top, this time only looking at the same one electron path. So these electrons then are emitted from the source. The objective lens this time is not used to re reconstruct an image, but you focus onto the sample and then look at this one single electron and put a detector perfectly on axis to collect it. Then I should have the exact same path. And that means that if I then move my probe around the sample, if I scan it, and I, at each point of the sample, I collect the, uh, the intensity on this detector, I should create an image that looks almost the same as what I would have had uh, using uh, my TEM. Uh, of course, the disadvantage here is that you're having to scan, so it's not time efficient. It can introduce uh, um, some levels of um, distortions or impurity or, or disturbances if somebody opens the door, for instance, whilst you're uh, imaging. But the advantage is you focus all your electrons onto that one point on the sample, um, and therefore you can control where the scattering events are taking place and perhaps understand more easily uh, uh, in some cases what is happening and therefore uh, this is very well suited for a lot of applications in material science and of course you can also get uh, uh, your electrons through to a Neil spectrometer which is one of the advantages of this technique maybe i'll i'll just give you one um, example of what the consequences of reciprocity are for STEM versus TEM. Um, you can think of all the parameters and all the quantities for imaging that you use in a, in a, in a regular TEM experiment and have the equivalent in a STEM. Um, and likewise, you can have all the imaging modes that you have in a STEM and reproduce the exact same uh, imaging mode in a TEM. So for instance, I was telling you how the Z contrast or the HADF contrast using this annular dark field detector, this blue disc here with a hole in the middle, was very convenient in STEM because you put your probe here and you collect electrons scattered to high angles. So this is uh, quite efficient. But of course, if it exists in STEM, it must also exist in TM. So there's got to be a way to do high angle annular dark field in uh, with a parallel beam mode. And the way to think about it is to think about it upside down. What you want to do is reconstruct this and then project it through onto your detector at the bottom. And the way to do this is uh, quite obvious. You then put your parallel beam here and then tilt it. And then you just move that tilted beam around in covering the same range of angles that you would with your HADF detector and then collect the accumulated image at the bottom on a CCD. So that's the way you would do uh, annular dark fields using a TM, but it is not as uh, easy to do just because you have to tilt the beam and then precess it, rotate it. Um, and therefore, the, uh, just as doing parallel beam has advantages uh, for uh, speed of imaging and, and lack of, of disturbances and, and uh, issues with the envi environment, 
uh, in this particular case, HADF is more efficient uh, using a stem configuration. So it's just, as always, the case of choosing well uh, what your technique is and, and what you think to be doing. So um, this is something that will have been uh, uh, talked about already a little bit, uh, but I'll, I'll go back very briefly also um, to say that electrons are aberrated um, and we've heard about CS correction and, and perhaps it's nice to take a step back and, and look at it from an everyday life perspective. Um, we have seen this quote, this quote from Richard Feynman pretty much in every single presentation, so I can't, actually I was surprised not to see it in any of the other Hector's or, or, uh, or Christian's earlier, so I, I had to add it. Um, and then just to remind you that spherical aberration is the same issue that plagued the Hubble telescope when it went up to space uh, the first time around, and of course NASA had to send the space shuttle at the cost of the time of $600 million, so that was uh, back in, in uh, early 90s, uh, to go from an aberration plagued telescope to an aberration corrected telescope and looking at the very same uh, uh, galaxy core, of course you get a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more detail. Well, it turns out the same principle applies to microscopy. We have to go from an aberration plagued microscope to an aberration corrected microscope, thanks to the work of uh, the giants of our field. And I just could not uh, not show these people how Rose, Andre Krivenek and Max Heider, um, who of course were awarded the uh, uh, Cavley Prize for Nanoscience last year for their work on aberration correction, just to say that it is something that we're extremely fortunate to have had with our, within our, our working uh, career uh, in electron microscopy. Um, and the same applies in this case, you go from an aberration plagued image of graphite or graphene where you don't see very much to an aberration corrected stem image of graphene where you see every single carbon atom, this, each of these dots is a single carbon atom uh, and a brighter one here, which happens to be a single silicon atom. So you see all, all the changes and um, microscope manufacturers will point out that the cost of a machine like this, whilst extreme, it is still a few million dollars or a few million uh, euros. Uh, but it's nowhere near the $600 million that uh, costs uh, NASA uh, for the repair of, the, uh, of, of that telescope. Another uh, sort of taking a step back and trying to understand what this aberration business is all about um, is thinking of it in terms of photography. And a lot of microscopists are also keen photographers. And I always point out that uh, at the time when we at SuperSTEM were buying our first uh, uh, aberration corrected machine, so that was uh, 2001 or thereabouts, uh, I was actually trying to find an old vintage manual lens for uh, my camera. Uh, at the time I had the Nolte cameras. Um, and this manual lens had a specific uh, property which was, it was producing these uh, images. It's not an image that I took personally, it's the type of image that uh, are produced when your lens has a lot of CS, spherical aberration. And you look how it's a little fuzzy. Um, and the question I always ask students, it's a little bit more difficult to do this uh, when we are remote and uh, a few thousand miles away from one another um, is if this is the sort of image that I wanted to produce, why would I want a lens that has spherical aberration? And why do I not simply uh, change the focal uh, uh, points or defocus my lens a little bit to produce the same image? Um, and the answer to this, um, I'll leave it up in the air. Maybe one of you will raise their hand at the end of the, uh, of the talk. But that really is at the, at the heart of what it is that aberration correction and aberration does. There's uh, a difference between CS and defogus, they do almost the same thing, but not quite. Uh, and that's a subtlety that is perhaps interesting to, to try and understand a little bit. And again, I'll leave that up in the air for, for those of you who are interested um, to, to ask that question uh, once more when, you're, uh, when we're towards the end. Okay, uh, just a little bit of, of theory about how this is done because that was, uh, uh, we talked about aberration correction, but not really in practice. And it, it's kind of useful to understand um, what uh, uh, these values are. Um, and the typical graph that you see is something like this, where in a perfect microscope, you have a spherical wave or, uh, uh, or plane wave, depending on whether you're looking at a, a 
conventional TM or stem. And when the lenses are perfect, everything is focused onto just the perfect point. When you have spherical aberration, it's not quite the same. Um, the aberrated wavefront is bent a little bit too much. And therefore, instead of having a perfect point, and that's what Hector was showing, you have a circle or a disk of least confusion, um, which is sort of this blurry point instead of having a perfect, perfect point. What I really like to, uh, uh, to emphasize, and that's the reason I'm showing those, uh, those two slides, is the way to understand aberrations and the way to understand how your microscope is not perfect is to realize that what you want to quantify is how far away from this perfect case, this blue wavefront, the aberrated electrons in the microscopes uh, that are produced by the uh, poor lenses are. So you need to measure this distance or you need to measure how badly affected this red weight front is. So here I'm drawing it, it's spherical aberration, but I could also draw in something that is completely wiggly. It's like a, a, a snake going around. There's all sorts of very complicated aberrations. So it would, for instance, uh, if I uh, go into pen mode, say uh, my aberration front would look something like this. Um, and at each point, I would measure here I have a deviation of a certain value that is positive, here I have a deviation of a negative value, et cetera, et cetera. And at each point, I measure this deviation. And when I do that, uh, I have an aberration function. This just tells me how bad my lens is. Um, and this function, which looks like a three dimensional curve, I can fit, if you remember your first year uh, mathematics or your first year physics. I can just fit it uh, and do a Taylor expansion using Fourier coefficients. And each one of these uh, uh, Fourier coefficients or Taylor coefficients rather, um, I shall call it a aberration coefficient. Um, and this is all this is about when you hear about chroma astigmatism, threefold astigmatism, third order astigmatism, fourfold astigmatism or rosettes or whatever uh, name the aberrations you might hear, well, they are given a certain number of assumptions are just a way to represent uh, a mathematical description of how bad your wavefront is compared to the ideal case. Um, and uh, you can make it as complicated or, or as easy as possible, but uh, at the end of the day, it really has a very simple, uh, a simple origin. And it, it's, uh, it's sort of useful to know that this is the case. Thankfully, we had those three uh, distinguished people to thank for uh, making aberration correction a reality. Um, and so these days, what you can do is uh, extend the area in the wavefront where there is almost no distortion. So this is what this is uh, showing you. This is completely flat because there are no distortions and distortions only start happening on the outside, which means if you put an aperture in the middle here, will have no distortion from in your incoming wavefront and that will give you uh, a, just a plain flat magnification of the area onto which you put this probe. And this is why you always insert an aperture that is smaller than uh, um, the, the distorted uh, electron wavefronts that you see once you look into, uh, uh, in, into your wrong program or into your um, conversion beam electron diffraction pattern. But um, I don't have a lot of time to talk in more details about aberration correction. That would be another complete one hour of, of talk. I just want to give you some practical applications uh, of imaging modes and then go to yield. So again, very simply and without equations, just looking at how the images are formed. Something that I will repeat 15 times over between now and the end of the talk, the stem is nothing but an electron source. And then I'm putting a sample here and I have a lens, I will call it the objective lens uh, because this is uh, what it's called in the microscopes I use, but let's call it a probe forming lens. It's the lens that focuses the electrons from the source onto the sample. Um, maybe I want to put an aperture to, to limit those rays that are aberrated. That's what we were seeing in the slide before. So I put a, an aperture that blocks only the center bit which is where the, the field is nice and flat. And if I do this, what it does, it projects this beautiful uh, round, hopefully the contrast comes through on your end. Uh, there should be a, a green, faint green disc here. 
symbolizing the fact that we have a spherical wave front impinging on the sample. Um, and in this particular case, you'll notice that the sample is not at the focal point, it's just uh, before the, the focal point. So the, the microscope is under focused, I'm focusing after the sample. And the reason I do this is because uh, um, that has some useful uh, information and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, just to say that uh, if you, your sample is on some sort of axis, in this case, a three beam condition, we have diffraction, scattering happening. So I have a center disc, this is a blue disc here, and then I have a disc on the left, first order diffraction and disc on the right, second order diffraction. Um, and of course the electrons in the center have undergone a slightly different optical path to the electrons on the left. So in the overlap region, I have fringes, interference fringes, and on the right, I have different interference fringes. Uh, and that is key to understanding uh, the contrast mechanism in how the images are formed. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. It is important before we continue to remind you again once more of something you've seen in, in Christian's talk and in another's talk, and that is channeling. Um, I'm not going to go into too, too much detail. It's a very hand wavy way of understanding how the electrons, if I go back one slide, how these green electrons here actually propagate through the sample. How do they go across this blue block of material uh, that we've put in their path? Um, and one way of understanding it is to say, well, uh, the, uh, the sample, most of, of matter materials in general uh, are made of atoms um, and atoms have a nucleus, which is of course positively charged um, and then a cloud of electron moving around but it's rather loose. So if the electrons uh, are, are rather loose, but if there's a lot of positive charge located on this one small spot, the electron from the probe or from, uh, from the gun are going to be attracted to this positive charge. In other words, if you have a very dense line of nuclei, which all add up to give you a very strong positive potential because there's all those positive charges, the electrons are going to be attracted to it and they're going to channel through, they're going to be captured by this uh, long line uh, of positive charges. And of course, the heavier they are, the more um, positive charges they are, the more closely packed they are, the more positive charges they are, and therefore the more attractive it becomes for the probe electrons to stay close to this uh, column of atoms. This is why you call it channeling. It just sucks in all these electrons and then sends them through uh, the atomic column. And as a result, the probe electrons sort of go wiggle around, channel through the column, and they get a large probability or have a higher chance of coming very close to this nucleus, for instance. And at this point, for instance, that's a high probability of being scattered out to high angle, especially if this one is heavy, you've got a lot of charge and you get scattering out using Rutherford scattering or Z contrast scattering, which gives you uh, therefore high probability of giving contrast on your HADF detector. So this is sort of a, a hand, wavy, hand wavy way of explaining why you get good signal on an HADF detector when you are channeling, when you're in channeling conditions with your uh, crystal oriented to a zone axis. And the same argument of course goes also for if your electrons are channeling down the zone axis or down the column, they will have a, a larger probability to spend more time close to, uh, to the nuclei, but they also spend more time flying through the electron cloud around each of the atoms. And therefore you might have a higher probability also of exciting an inelastic scattering transition, uh, a core loss, which gives rise to energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, it's useful to see that happening in practice. So let's imagine, for instance, that we have uh, a set of atoms. These red dots here uh, are, are meant to represent atoms. Let's say silicon atoms in a 110 uh, zone axis where you have a dumbbell of silicon atoms, two here and then two there and then another two here. And then I'm going to put my probe, my electrons, either straight here in the middle or again in the middle of this frame, but this time I'm not on the column of atom, I'm just next to it. And we'll focus on, on, on these three uh, up here. Uh, or in this case, if the probe of atom hits the sample here, you'll see it's right in between, uh, the probe, uh, my probe of electrons hit the, uh, the sample here, it's right in between those two columns. So let's see what uh, happens to those electrons. So this is where I put my, my probe. 
And the intensity here shows you where there's a lot of electrons. So you see that when it hits this column initially, it starts being focused, that's channeling. You see it condensed around this, probe, uh, the, this uh, column of atoms. But after you reach something like 35 nanometers, you start seeing things uh, beating. There's a lot of intensity away from where the electrons were initially. And that's what Christian was saying when he was saying it's actually complicated to understand what's happening because the electrons channel in, but then at some point they get scattered. And when they get scattered, they can be captured by the next column along. And therefore you need to understand this probe propagation mechanism using quantum physics um, and propagation of the probe using multi-slice simulations to understand what the signal or where the signal that you're observing after 60 nanometers, for instance, comes from. And if you rewind it, you'll see that here I put the initially on the right-hand side, I put the electrons in between the two columns of atom, but somehow the electrons get focused onto uh, the columns themselves instead of going straight through where the electrons were initially. So it, it is complicated, but you can still understand roughly what's going on. So if I do slices, all the way through the thickness of this sample. It's the same sample. I put my electrons at the top where there's a uh, silicon um, column here, and then the electrons are channeled. They get focused along the column of atoms, and then they start spreading out, and there's some scattering, and it gets captured uh, to the right. Now, if I put a gold atom, gold, of course, is a lot heavier than silicon. If I put it somewhere here in the middle uh, and do the exact same thing, you'll see that as soon as the electrons are captured, they get channeled initially and then they hit this gold atom and it sort of splashes out just because it's heavier. So there's a lot more scattering. Again, uh, another way of hand waving my way around how and why uh, um, uh, HADF contrast or contrast when you're on zone axis in a stem with a probe focused on the top of the column uh, uh, happens. Right, I was promising you uh, some images, so let, let's do this. We start with a source of electrons. Again, same thing that I've seen, I've said many times already. Those electrons are sent down the column. Further down the column, I have a lens. This lens focuses the electrons onto the sample, but I also put an objective aperture or condenser aperture, a probe forming aperture to limit the angular range to only those electrons that are not too aberrated. These electrons are impinging on the sample. And then when I'm in under focus in three beam condition, I get overlaps between the right and the center, between the left and the center. That gives me different fringes. Um, and when I, for instance, look at what happens uh, with placing a camera at this position here, this is what I see. I see exactly that. I see a whole set of fringes. Um, in this case, it's not only three beam condition, it is many beam condition. And one thing that I should say is at this stage, we are not scanning. We are completely, completely stationary. All we're doing is illuminating the sample with a convergent beam and seeing these interference fringes in under focus with the, the sample being placed before the focal point. Okay, that's so far so good. Um, you'll notice that these fringes almost look, and that's a, an important point to, to explain, um, they already bear and represents the symmetry of the crystal. In this case, this is silicon in 110 orientation. Uh, and you could almost try and understand this image or this diffraction pattern, because this is what it is. It is a convergent, large angle convergent beam diffraction pattern, which people also sometimes call the ronchigram, as a magnified image of the lattice or of the sample that's over here. So, uh, in a very basic interpretation, you could say that when uh, the electrons hit the column of atom here, there's some matter and then it gets scattered out to the high angle and therefore you create uh, a deficit of electronic density when it propagates through and in exactly the same way as you would have a shadow image of your hand. I hope you can see my uh, camera when you're looking uh, at me. If I project a shadow with a, a flashlight of my hand onto a wall, you see a magnified image of, of that hand onto the wall, the same thing as uh, um, uh, any shadow projection. Um, and of course, if you start then moving that sample closer to the focal point, you're focusing or you're illuminating now only a tiny, tiny piece of the sample. And again, if you have an expensive microscope, this piece of the sample is now about an angstrom in size. So what I see here in perfect focus is a magnified image with uh, at least down in the middle here of the one spot on the sample where my probe is positioned. 
Um, now let's try and make an image out of this. We put a detector here on this position in the far field. And remember, so far we were not scanning, we were just purely uh, stationary, but we're gonna scan, start scanning now. So I put the probe on the sample, put a, a bright field detector in, collect the intensity at this position, and then store it in one first pixel in the bottom uh, top left corner. And then I move my probe to another spot of the sample. And then when I do so, the intensity here changes because my probe is not exactly in the same position. That gives me another um, number or another intensity. And then I store it in the second pixel. And if I do this for very many pixels, I get an image. And because if you remember the reciprocity principle, what I'm looking at is the on axis intensity this image will look and feel very much like what you would get from a regular uh, TEM image. Um, so this is what we call this a bright field image. It has some subtleties, uh, again, because we are using a convergent beam to create it. So it's not exactly equivalent, uh, but it has similar properties in that if you'll notice going from this side of the image to that side of the image, uh, this is the edge of the sample. And you'll notice how the uh, atomic columns are inverted from here to there. So what's in the same structure was bright becomes dark at the top here. And these are contrast inversions due to uh, thickness uh, of the sample. But then if at the same time, I also put an annular detector and I collect those electrons that are scattered to really high angle, those Z contrast electrons, those Rutherford scattered electrons, um, then I get an annular dark field image and I get it at the same time. I can collect both of these images at the same time. And this one is a little bit easier to understand because there are no contrasting versions. This is just due to the scattering from the nuclei. And because you're collecting them with an annular detector, the electrons that land on this side of the detector have no phase relationship whatsoever with the electrons that uh, land on that side. They have gone through completely different optical paths and therefore they're added up incoherently. And this is why Z contrast or HADF imaging is usually called incoherent imaging is because you're averaging over different trajectories that are not coherent with one another. And therefore you kill out uh, interference effects and you build an image that is mostly uh, uh, um, a factor or, or um, uh, a function of how heavy the atomic columns were at this position. And therefore, uh, it, it's, this is why it looks like Z contrast. And again, if you go from the thin bit to the thick bit, all you do is you have slightly less intensity on the same columns, but uh, otherwise the contrast doesn't invert. Um, and this has some really nice properties. That has the nice properties that if you have small enough of an object, for instance, a nanoparticle with only a few thousand atoms within it, uh, as, as long as it is small enough, this uh, increase of intensity as a function of the number of atoms and a function of the uh, uh, weight of the atom is roughly linear. That breaks down very easily, very quickly when you start to get to thicker samples and then you have to understand things uh, uh, in a more difficult way. But if it's thin and if it's small, you can quantify exactly, and this is a good example done by people at the University of Birmingham very early on, uh, uh, so 2008 in, uh, in, in this field uh, of uh, uh, reconstructing uh, and counting atoms. And they knew that each one of these gold particles had exactly 309 gold atoms. Uh, and they could look at uh, projections uh, of these gold atoms and roughly count how many of those they were and get good agreements between the theory and the, uh, and the experimental images. And of course, the field has moved on quite a bit. Uh, you can count atoms in, uh, in a very careful way. And perhaps one of the good examples that Christian already talked about, and I'm going back to it because this is collaboration that we've had going for the best part of 15 years now, looking at those nanocatalysts. Uh, these are on graphite. So you see just one, two, three layers of graphite perhaps. And on top of it is a single layer of molybdenum uh, a disulfide. And you just about see some contrast at the edge of the molybdenum disulfide nanoparticle. You can make it in color because it's easier to see, but you can then also count, look at the intensity of each of those uh, columns and then decide uh, and deduct rather than decide that the intensity at the edge of this particle corresponds to one extra sulfur atom. So you can be, you can be quantitative about it, certainly for very thin samples. Again, in the thickness of that particular sample, there are 
maybe six or seven only atoms. So you can count these, um, not uh, when you're looking at much thicker samples. When looking at thicker samples, and I'm, I'm going a little bit faster on this slide so I can get to the, the thick samples. When having thicker samples, there are also ways to be quantitative, um, but you have to resort to image simulation. So that's uh, work by uh, Jim Rebeau back in 2008, also comparing experimental images of strontium titanate at even 105 nanometer thick. So that's a very thick sample uh, for complex oxide, certainly to uh, what I call frozen phonon simulations, which is sort of the gold standard for simulations. And provided you characterize very, very carefully your, uh, your microscope, the detector response, the sample thickness, provided you have a model for what you're trying to image, and that's a big if, most of the time you're looking at things you don't necessarily know, but provided you have a model, you can have a one-to-one -one match without any fudge factor, uh, without uh, completely independence in the theory or number of electrons that you've sent through. Um, but that is, uh, and sometimes it's just uh, too much work if all you want to do is just check that the structure makes sense. So you always have to decide how much work you have. <laughs> right, what, what else can HRD images? We've had dark field images that we quite can quantify um, um, almost uh, without any parameter, so we can uh, be fully quantitative about how many atoms we've got in a given column. Um, but what happens um, when you change perhaps the detector that you're using? I've been calling it an annular detector, and I say I have a hole in the middle, but I've not told you how big a hole I'm putting in. Uh, and that is a very important parameter. In practice, the way you choose the size of this hole in the detector is by changing the camera length. Essentially, you changing a uh, uh, value of the lens that's between the sample and the de detector at the bottom here. So you're changing the projection system. And in doing so, you're making the electrons squeeze in more or spread out more onto your detector. And when you do that, you essentially do something like this to your detector. Maybe it goes from effectively being very high angle to being less high angle. And when it's less high angle, you see you're starting to integrate a lot more of those not so high angle scattered electrons that maybe still are influenced a lot by Bragg scattering. So you're adding in a lot of what would be Bragg diffraction contrast, uh, and that is particularly useful for things, uh, uh, for materials that have defects or that have strain in it, because these electrons will have perhaps been scattered more into this sort of intermediate region if there's a defect or if there's a little bit of strain in the material, you get more intensity here just from the effect on channeling due to strain. And this is what you see in these images, for instance, where depending on the camera length, this is the exact same area, but all of a sudden when you change your camera length and you get closer to the bright field disk, you see those defects appear. Uh, so this is in a nickel superalloy. The same goes for things like solar cells, uh, copper, indium, gallium, selenide here. And you see those bright lines there. Um, I'm not going to show you the, uh, the, the results of it, but you hopefully can trust me. Uh, these are actually atomic, uh, sh atomically sharp. So each of those is actually um, uh, a stacking fault and the boundary between uh, the two is always atomically sharp. So even though you are looking at the field of view of the order of three, four microns, you, you can already go hunting for defects um, at this length scale by changing your camera length and by lighting up areas where strain contrast gives you an idea of where those atomic size defects might be located. And of course, it works at atomic scale. So these are, again, uh, two images of the exact same position in the sample taken with two different angles of your detector. And in one of them, it looks like a regular image. There's uh, an anti-phase boundary that you see diagonally over here. But on the right-hand side, you'll notice there's extra contrast, this sort of uh, honeycomb pattern uh, round shapes. And these are actually due to uh, uh, ordered oxygen vacancies or ordered oxygen uh, distortions or distortions of the oxygen sublattice uh, and the difference between the right and the left hand side because of that anti phase boundary. It's not only an anti phase boundary shifting this way, but the crystals have also been rotated 90 degrees. So you see a different projection of what you would all otherwise have thought was the exact same structure looking only at this high angle annular dark field. So again, it's important to know what your angles are, what your camera length is, because you can play with it to your advantage to see more effects in the images and to understand a lot more about your material. Another example of this is something that is called annular bright field. Um, and that's um, been uh, popularized in the last 
10 years or so by a group in Japan, in particular in the University of Tokyo. Um, and this time, instead of taking a annular detector that does not include the bright field disk, the Santa straight through beam, uh, what they did was to actually squish that detector to be exactly overlapping with the center disk, but still leaving a hole in the middle. This is what is called annular bright field. You still take the bright field disk, but you still have an annular detector. And I'll uh, skip over the uh, wave optical explanations for why this is, but this particular imaging mode gives you the ability to, to see more clearly uh, uh, light um, uh, elements. Uh, again, if you remember, HADF or dead contrast imaging works great for very heavy elements. The heavier, the better. You get a lot of contrast on your Z contrast detector. Something like oxygen, um, something like nitrogen, something uh, like hydrogen is very light. And therefore, there are not very many electrons that can be scattered by a column that has only oxygen. Uh, but using this, uh, this mode, you can see uh, here in particular around this column, you see the shadow on either side corresponds to two oxygen columns, which are extremely difficult to distinguish in the equivalent HADF image. So that's a way to see light atomic columns. And you immediately see where I'm going with this. If I can play with the, um, with the contrast, if I can have different physical effects by changing the camera length and changing how I integrate the electrons in the far field in this geometry, in this scanning transmission electron microscope geometry, well, why don't I simply put a detector that is extremely large and at each pixel on my sample, at each position on my sample, instead of integrating um, over a given range, I just collect absolutely every electron that has been scattered. And afterwards, I can perhaps reconstruct uh, different types of images by selecting uh, in post-processing the angular range over which you do your averaging. And this is what is now called, it's called in a fashionable way, 4D stem or, or bacography or whatever uh, method it is. Essentially, it is just diffractive imaging. You are collecting the entire far field scattering and you are then using that and your understanding of how the physics has placed uh, these or that electron in a in a given place in a reciprocal space or in a far field uh, to reconstruct images. And you can reconstruct bright field, annular bright field, or annular dark field images of various uh, um, angular ranges just from one data set. Um, but before uh, I go further on this, again, this is something that you'll see a lot in uh, uh, applications from manufacturers or, or from uh, various people. Uh, there's something to be said about being careful with doing this. Um, Number one is if you put a detector in a far field, you can't do eels. And the last 15 minutes of my talk, yes, we still have about 15 minutes, will be devoted to eels. And um, as you will uh, be able to tell, I like eels and I would be very sad if all of a sudden I put a detector and I can't have a hole in the middle and I can't do electrons and energy loss spectroscopy. Um, the other aspect of it, and of those new detectors, and I've put uh, references down at the bottom here for some of the earlier detectors that have now become the basis for what you might hear from uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, the so-called MPAD uh, detector that is being marketed very heavily. Um, the only problem is it's a four-dimensional data set. So at each position on your sample, and maybe you want an image that is 1K by 1K, you will have an entire diffraction pattern, and maybe that diffraction camera itself is 2K by 2K. So the uh, amount of data you're collecting becomes exponentially large. Um, and perhaps all you needed to answer your one question was one image, one simple ADF image, and that's all you needed. So before calling 4D STEM uh, the answer to everything, you, and that's a true of every single technique in microscopy that you might want to use. I'm, I'm not just uh, uh, trying to make 4D stem or to give 4D stem a bad name. That would be the same for eels or for anything. You have to think very hard about what it is that you want to answer, what the best technique is to address that particular question, and then use that technique rather than blindly uh, use something that somebody like me, for instance, tells you that stem is the best um, when there's perhaps a far better technique uh, maybe using an SEM for that matter. Who needs one extra resolution when your uh, objects are nanometers in size, for instance? So always think about uh, what the data is that you want to collect and why you want to collect it before uh, collecting gigabytes and gigabytes of data. 
I think that's perhaps a, as important a, a take home message as, as can be. Right, I'll skip over three dimensional uh, and tomography because I don't have much time uh, unless there are questions and I've, I've not heard anybody interrupt me. So I'm, I'm taking it to mean that uh, everybody's following and, and, and we're all good. Um, but um, I'll finish uh, by going on to STEM and uh, um, STEM eels in particular. To recap it again, we start with an electron source. We send our electrons onto our objective lens or our probe forming lens. We put an aperture to remove aberrations or the aberrations we haven't been able to correct. This then sends electrons onto a sample. We get some scattering um, with interference fringes that are essentially just a shadow image of our sample. This is what we understand here. This is the shadow image of the sample. When we put the sample in focus, then we get a shadow image of just one point of the sample. We can put a single bright field detector and then start scanning our sample to build a bright field image. Or we can put in an annular detector with different angular ranges, start scanning and get an HADF, detect, uh, HADF image. And then down the middle, we still have this hole and we can do something with these electrons. Uh, and for instance, if we put some extra lenses to squish the beam into an yield aperture, then we can send all of that into a NEO spectrometer. Uh, and one thing to be careful about, of course, and that's uh, for those of you who are perhaps aware of that, is if my electrons here have lost a little bit of energy, the red electrons maybe will not be focused in the same way by the lenses. Um, and so the focal point with the red electrons compared to the black electrons, uh, and um, using black, red and black uh, as a proxy for different energies, but that's the same idea as wavelength. So in, in effect, it's a, it's a good comparison or a good analogy. Then the focal point may be a little bit different and therefore your EEL spectrometer may not be able to give you as good an image or as good in, information and you'll have to refocus and, and be very careful. So that's just as an aside um, uh, to tell you uh, uh, a little bit about the details before we go into those uh, uh, post column filters. So if we go from here, this crossover here, this is the object that the EEL spectrometer at the bottom of the column will be looking at. And this is this object here that you then send through your EEL spectrometer entrance aperture and into the spectrometer itself. So if you're not familiar with EEL spectrometers, it's extremely simple as a principle. Um, you'll see that there's a 90 degree turn. And the reason for that 90 degree turn is we're trying to separate these electrons by the amount of energy they've lost. And the best way to do this is using essentially the same principle as cyclotron. Uh, you apply a magnetic field and this magnetic field will bend the electrons but of course it will bend them differently depending on what their energy or what the initial speed is. So if you send them through a prism in one plane, the dispersion plane, depending on their speed, their energy, their color, the electrons will be refocused on the exit side of this spectrometer at a different point. So you can say these electrons have lost zero energy. These electrons here have lost 10 electron volts of energy. Um, through the plane of the spectrometer in here, there is no such uh, um, effect because it's essentially just a flat uh, uh, magnetic sector. And so the, uh, in the other projection, there is simply a uh, um, spatial refocusing. So this is a spot and this is why a zero loss spectrum is or zero loss camera in spectroscopy mode has a dispersive direction. This is where you spread the energy. And in the other direction, it is focused onto as small uh, uh, a pixel as you can. And this is what you observe on the camera in a sense. It's a histogram, but uh, um, this would essentially be just the averaged version of what I was just describing, where in this direction, I have a dispersion in energy. I have a lot of electrons that have lost almost no energy. Um, um, and I have a few electrons that have lost uh, a little bit of, uh, of energy. And in the average direction, you see that it's all nicely focused or as focused as possible so that uh, we don't have any crossover or any crosstalk between the different energy channels. And very typically, you uh, separate different regions of the energy loss spectrum into different uh, names. 
you would call them um, core loss, low loss, and then things around the uh, alpha low loss region, which we may not have much time to talk about other than to very briefly uh, touch on. Um, and these have different types of applications. So very briefly, core loss is usually associated with elemental analysis. This is chemical mapping uh, in the same way as you would do with X-ray uh, absorption spectroscopy. Uh, these are, uh, we'll see electron losses that are associated with promoting one of the core electrons that are zooming around the atoms in the material uh, from this core state to uh, an available energy state in the continuum. So this is one electron from the probe, zoom, zip, uh, uh, zooming past, hits or interacts with one of the electrons from the atoms, scatters, loses some energy, and then you see it there. And that will give you information about uh, what electrons were zooming around the atom. And of course, it's very sensitive to what type of atom this was. But that, there are other things that happen also in a low loss, uh, plasmons, optical uh, response band gaps, um, and then the ultra low loss, uh, very, very low energy losses, you start looking at what is called quasi-elastic or quasi-inelastic losses, phonon losses, um, and various other quasi-particles uh, uh, that exist. We'll, uh, we'll go into this in a minute. Um, and the reason this is very powerful in the STEM in particular is because you have a scanning probe that is focused onto your small point. So at each point on your sample, you can collect a spectrum that is characteristic of that one point. And the smaller your probe, um, the more or the finer the information is. And as you scan across your sample point by point, at each point you collect a spectrum, therefore building what people call the data cube or the hyperspectral uh, data set, essentially uh, fancy words for telling you I have an XY map giving me at each position some physical property an EL spectrum, an EBX spectrum, a cathode luminescence spectrum, or something else, for instance. Uh, and this is really the power of this scanning probe geometry where you can build point by point knowing exactly where the information comes from. So let's try and uh, look very briefly, uh, and I'm conscious of the fact that I'm, I'm almost running out of time. We had said about uh, 1.30, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, what uh, sort of information you can get? So core loss first, and as I said, core loss is easy, relatively easy to understand. Your probe electron comes through, it goes a little too close to one of these electrons from the atom that we're zooming past, interacts with it, that sends this electron from the uh, um, energy level that it was occupying onto an energy level that is available, so the unoccupied density of state, whilst the probe electron in doing so has lost, has lost energy and therefore we can pick it up in, in, through our spectrometer. And you can immediately see how this is useful because the electrons that you had in your, uh, in your atom or in your, in your sample is part of this density of electronic states. So density of states, uh, this is all the electrons and how many electrons there are per given energy. And if you kick one of these from here, to the empty state, um, then I have a very well-defined shape for however uh, many empty states are available. And if I do this enough, I can populate this entire shape and then get what looks like the experimental edge. And you can immediately see that the experimental edge looks similar. There are some factors that are convoluted with it with the empty density of states. So in other words, core loss spectroscopy probes, the local density, local density of unoccupied states. It gives you immediately access to your electronic structure of your material, uh, which is the reason why it's, uh, it's uh, so useful and, and, and used so many times. One of the things uh, to, um, to highlight is the fact that even at low magnification or low resolution, so in this case, it's looking at organics in meteorites, um, and you'll notice immediately that the scale bar is 200 nanometers. This was a nice collaboration with a friend of ours, Christian Polma from the uh, University of Münster. Um, looking at carbon and nitrogen in these, uh, in these samples. And it's 200 nanometers with no, no single atom, yet it is interesting to do this with eels rather than H-ray spectroscopy. And that's perhaps uh, my little uh, sales spiel in that um, 
if you do an eel spectrum image, you can put your probe at the bottom of this uh, area of the sample and your probe at the top of the, the area of the sample. And uh, you can, uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, very familiar with eels, you can trust me when I say that at 284 electron volt energy loss, I have a peak, uh, a spectrum that corresponds to carbon. And then these two little bunny ears here at 346 electron volts correspond to calcium. And then at 401 electron volts, I have something that corresponds to nitrogen. And I get, uh, of course, a carbon map, a nitrogen map, and a calcium map, and you can, you can see that the nitrogen is really located at the rim of this sample. And you can say, fine, I get exactly the same information with an SEM using EDX uh, or in a TEM using EDX. The power of using eels is the fact that the shape of your carbon K edge is different between this area and that area. And this shape difference reflects the unoccupied density of states, and that in turn uh, in turn reflects uh, the uh, functional groups or the uh, specific transitions that are available. So you can not only do chemical mapping, but you can also map the fact that down here, of course, there's no nitrogen, so there's no carbon to nitrogen bond, whereas up there, there is a very much stronger carbon to nitrogen bond where there's a lot more nitrogen. You can see that with the extra wiggles here and that one, the blue the blue band uh, being stronger in this case than in that case. So you also have bonding with a local, uh, uh, local information, local aspects. And of course, it goes without saying that you can do this at uh, atomic resolution, uh, what we might want to call seeing atoms in color, this time looking at a perovskite sample, uh, uh, bismuth quantum manganate, uh, BSMO, uh, one of the very first ones ever done in 2007, showing that you can map uh, where the manganese and the oxygen, uh, sorry, manganese down here and, and oxygen columns uh, are located. Um, it's since, of course, uh, gone to uh, bigger and better things. This is slightly less noisy data from 10 years later, where you can, can map titanium, oxygen, neodymium, or barium. And with very stable microscopes, if you really push the envelope, you can do very large atomically resolved eels maps. So each of those is atomic columns resolved at the atomic scale. Um, and at each point, you can also look at the oxygen columns and see if there is uh, a change in fine structure or change in the shape of the oxygen K uh, uh, spectrum to give you bonding information. But I'm really uh, starting to uh, run out of time. So I'll just say one more word about uh, other applications, perhaps. Um, and that application concerns uh, one of the other uh, areas uh, in the spectrum, and that is the low loss. If you remember, we talked about the core loss. Um, I just want to have two minutes to talk about the, the low loss. This time, it's not local density of states, but it's uh, something else entirely. And let's focus, for instance, on plasmons. So when your electrons go through the material, they also see the general dielectric field that is created by the fact that your material has valence electrons. They're, they're round, they're shared, they sort of uh, float. You can think of it in terms of an, an electron C. That's uh, um, what uh, in certain models is called a jellium, where you have this jelly of electrons that sort of surrounds uh, uh, the nuclei. And when the electrons from the probe interact with uh, this valence sea of electrons, um, well, electrons don't like other electrons. They are both negatively charged, and therefore they're going to repel one another. Uh, and in doing so, the electrons from the material are going to be pushed away from the probe electron, but of course they'll want to come back in once the probe electron has moved, and you'll have this oscillation of the valence electrons. And this is what you call a plasmon, what you can describe as a quasi-particle called a plasmon. And you see those in the low loss and the amount of energy required to generate one of these waves of valence electrons is not as high as the core losses. It is more in the uh, uh, tens of electron volts uh, uh, 10 to 20 electron volts. So here's the case of uh, carbon or graphite where you have a plasmon at 5 EV and a plasmon at 25 EV. And you can understand this in terms of the band structure of graphite, uh, which is what I'm showing you here, where you can understand how certain valence electrons, uh, you can go from the uh, uh, conduction band to the valence band to the conduction band and understand what each of those peaks uh, is and how it relates to the electronic property. And I have, let me look at my watch. I'll spend just three minutes exactly before I release you all. I uh, realize it's late uh, and it is also late on my end. Um, just to say that there are new uh, 
feels opened, being opened in, in this regime in that um, the typical energy resolution of electron guns up to maybe a few years ago uh, was the best attainable was about 350 milli electron volts, 0.3 EV. That was when using a cold field emitter. Uh, a Lab 6 that we talked about, or Shotkey uh, that we uh, didn't touch on, but that is also one of the available types of electron emitters, would have higher energy velocities. But very recently, there's been a push towards uh, reducing this energy resolution. So you judge the energy resolution by the width of the zero loss peak. So this is the how well defined your electrons are coming in. And thanks to things that are called a monochromator, and as the name indicates, you uh, select one single color, monochrome. Um, we can now get, uh, and so in our case with neon microscopes, with our other manufacturers that are also pushing the envelope there to energy resolutions or uh, zero loss peaks of the order of milli electron volts, eight milli electron volts. And that means that this entire region of the spectrum down here, that up to now was completely hidden under the zero loss peak is now available. So you can go and look at phonons, you can go and look at other types of excitations on the milli electron loss level, whilst retaining the probe that is uh, as small as an angstrom or, or even smaller than this. Um, and what that allows you to do is, well, phonons, as I said, um, but perhaps even going further than this, um, different vibrational responsive materials may also depend on the type of isotope. Um, so this is looking at molecular deposits, uh, uh, and that's work from Oak Ridge National Lab looking, uh, showing that using this phonon spectroscopy, using the increased energy resolution of the microscope, you can distinguish between two areas of uh, molecular deposits where one has carbon-12 and the other one has carbon-13, and you can determine that at the nanometer scale, fair enough, it is 200 nanometers in this case, but we're hoping to bring that down even more to the single atom level. And we know that is possible because we have shown, and that's the last slide I'll show just as a little bit of self-promotion as it were, since this was work we did at SuperSTEM, uh, we have shown that you can map the intensity of the phonon peaks in the milli electron volt regime at the atomic scale and even down to a single atom, which basically uh, suggest we should be able to do vibrational spectroscopy uh, at the single atom level in uh, using eels. Um, and that to me is exciting because that's yet another bit of physics that wasn't accessible in the electron microscope up to now. I have run out of time. Um, you're very welcome to look at this list of, uh, of books, but interestingly, it's exactly the same list of books that both Hector and Christian showed. So it shows that we're not very inventive or rather that we re we're reading the very same things. Um, that should be a good uh, indication that those books are well worth reading if all of us are referring back to the same one. Um, and last but not least, I'll thank you. I'll uh, thank the guys at SuperSTEM who uh, helped doing a lot of this work and support uh, the lab. And I'll take questions if there are any, unless you are all running out uh, to get some lunch and or dinner, depending which side of the Atlantic you're on. I see Christian is clapping. <laughs> are there other questions? I don't see any, any raised hand. Uh, I suppose it's been five hours and we've been talking at you, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. The usual suspect, I see Ivan has a question, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Very, very interesting. Uh, well, I wanted well, just a simple question. It's about what you mentioned. The let me see the the carbon correction that was made by Chesser, I think. So you mentioned something like that. So I have some doubts about it. I don't know if you can give me some uh, more detailed information about it. In, in, in what consists uh, carbon correction? More. Uh, aberration more correction. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I went, I went a little quickly on this because uh, I was running out of time. Um, 
but I can definitely uh, give you a little bit more, more detail. So um, let's see if I can find the right slide. Otherwise, I can talk you through it because that's, uh, that's easy enough. Um, let's see where my slides are. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, where is that thing? Uh, there you are. Um, Yes, right. it was so first of all, almost in the in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's it, but then I had I have some extra ones to <laughs> to extrapolate on this. But let's let's go back to this indeed. Um, there, I'll project that. Um, oops, where is my share? Sorry, share screen again. Right, it is. It should now be sharing. I hope it is. <laughs> Right, so we, we cannot that's see. The slide that, yeah, that's the slide I went through. So in a nutshell, what Scherzer showed in 1936 um, was that if you use what you everybody needs to use for uh, uh, electron microscopes, which are round lenses, these are symmetries. So it's basically uh, you take a, uh, some copper wire and you, you spin it around uh, soft iron core and you can show that when you use this geometry the magnetic field that this produces can help focus on it. the first effect is actually it makes electrons rotate um, but the secondary effect is it actually focuses if it's uh, if it's long enough the problem with these things is unlike um, optical lenses like my glasses that i'm wearing um, electrons somehow charge particles and magnetic field and electronic electromagnetic fields do not stop immediately as you get away from the sample. They continuous. That's that's what Maxwell's equations tell you. So because of that, there is no way to make a perfect round lens. They will always have round aberrations, provided the number of uh, um, uh, of elements are maintained. And these elements are system is rotationally symmetric. That's uh, uh, what is useful for focusing, so we don't really want to get uh, to get rid of that uh, for strong focusing. Um, produces a real image of the object. It's kind of useful to have a real image if you want to actually do microscopy. No time variation. Um, there are pr uh, proposals to, to address this, and then there's no charge on the axis. And you may have heard of, of holography. There are ways to uh, go around this by putting uh, charge charges on the axis that day. But um, that was. The four uh, uh, main uh, criteria that need to be fulfilled to get uh, uh, that are always fulfilled and it will get, always get you spherical aberration. And so, what Scherzer proposed was to say, well, maybe instead of having round lenses, we're going to have non round lenses. So, we're going to go away from rotationally symmetric lenses. We're going to use other types of lenses. Um, and in particular, uh, lenses that are called multiple. So, this is why all of these uh, are correctors use multiple optics. And these lenses, uh, one of the most simple one, you know, is dipole. Uh, is basically just shifting the beam sideways. Um, but there are also other lenses, like quadruple, which turn something round into something that is elongated. That's what you would call, you would use to correct astigmatism. But the two really important ones are sextuples and octuples. And these turn something round into a triangle and something round into something that is a little bit square. But there's also another effect of these two. That's a secondary effect, and that is the field doesn't stay perfectly flat. It actually, so if you look at it sideways, it actually goes out this way. It adds positive, uh, uh, sorry, negative spherical aberration to the, to the field in addition to making it square. And so if you make these, and if you put them in the right order, and if you put several of them to make sure your beam stays round, you can build up a little bit of positive spherical aberration, negative spherical collaboration to counteract your positive spherical collaboration from the lens. And then when you add it all up, it goes flat and you have no CS. So that's the uh, roughly the principle that he proposed in so Scherzer's theorem 1936, his proposal for aberration correction 1937, first practical implementation 1997. Okay, so we must take care of not using a lot of lenses just to to, to try to. And as a general to principle, um, yeah. if you have a simple system, that's easier to align and that's easier to use. That doesn't mean 
uh, that you should have fewer lenses. If you want to do aberration correction, you have no choice, but you have a very, very complicated optical arrangements. This is how it works. Um, and the reason it took so long to be realized in practice is because a simple human being um, is just too stupid to actually do all the corrections uh, fast enough. Um, so we needed computers, we needed high precision manufacturing, uh, and Hal Rose, who's uh, uh, designs and who was also instrumental in doing all of this also recalls that's the first corrector he ever built um, um, was in principle fine the principle was perfectly working the only thing is by the time he had finished aligning lens number 100 and something then his lens number one was out of alignment because the power supplies had drifted off um, and so you can only do this if you're quick enough so you have layers of complexity to help you align these things but for me, as a general principle, if you don't need them um, for to answer your question, um, scientific question, that is, um, no need to go complex. Just go simple, something that gives you the answer without having to, to pay too much or work too hard. I'm just lazy. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Okay, right. more more questions. Don't see any further questions. It might all be time to go and have some sleep, perhaps. <laughs> After the beer. After the beer, yes. The virtual beer. <laughs> Sadly, it cannot okay. be a pina colada. <laughs> Okay. Questions? No. No, no. No. Okay. I don't see any questions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for the presentation. Uh, uh, on behalf of the of the Mexican Society of Materials, we appreciated the presentation of the tutorial uh, novel techniques for electron microscopy of nanomaterials and the Ether structures uh, presented by Christian Kisilovsky, Quentin, Quentin? Quentin, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and Hector Calderon. Thank you very much for presentations. Uh, one moment. And... The okay, the certificate, the certificates will be sent to your emails. Thank you very Thank much you. for the uh, the presentation. Uh, we appreciate the, the the presentation the, of the tutorial. Uh, uh, is the This certificate is awarded to Quentin Ramas uh, for the tutorial. Okay. Thank you very much for all. And... Thank you all. See you later at the symposium on Tuesday. Don't forget yeah. the uh, symposium yeah, on Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. See you soon, everyone. See you on Tuesday at the very latest. See you to guys. Thank See you. you. Yep. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye, thank you.